And we are live. What's up, dude? How's it going? Uh, enjoying my night. How about you? Yeah, dude. Honestly, it's really fucking cold outside in Kansas City, and I realized that I took a nap earlier um, before we were going to do this because I was a little tired or whatever, and I fell asleep, and it was like 3.30, and the window was like open, and so it was shining sun down on me. It was nice and warm. I fell asleep. I woke up an hour later, took my dog out. I was like, oh, my God, it's cold out here. Like the daylight savings time is still fucking with me a little bit when the night, like the night just creeps up so quickly. But other than that, I'm doing good. Yeah, it is getting dark out. I always forget that that happens every year. And then it starts getting dark at like five o'clock. And I think it's like nine o'clock. Really yeah, I know. It's so weird how it fucks with your circadian rhythm like that. Like if you fall asleep and it's still completely bright out and you're just taking like an afternoon cat nap, you know, it's probably like four fifteen. 15. I fell asleep perfectly bright out you know everything's looking good woke up five o'clock oh my god it's pitch black outside what the hell is going on <laughs> yeah yeah it, it is a live stream it <laughs> is crazy I'll, I'll, I'll genuinely think it's like nine o'clock and then be shocked when i look at my watch or whatever and see it's like six but uh yeah. if anyone's just joining the stream this is the vanguard live stream uh we're your host i'm gavin and i'm zach and we're about to be joined by our our good friend kamali over at uh, radical democracy the radical democracy show uh so he'll be popping in here soon um yeah i uh, had a little bit of our own news to share uh, if gavin if you want to get into that yeah so uh we did have a little bit of channel news to share today with you guys you know we've been putting in so much hard work here at the vanguard just so much uh time with these interviews and, and videos and and all the great content we're uh, making for you all and uh yeah, we decided to start a Patreon just to, you know, help this be a little bit more sustainable. Um, again, a lot of work is going into it. So we thought it was, uh, you know, appropriate and, and time to to roll out the Patreon. Um, we have a couple cool levels for you guys. I, I can uh, share my screen so you can see that. But yeah, um, the Patreon or patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel is where you can find um, our stuff. And yeah, here you'll see we have three levels of membership. And, and yeah, this is just uh, if you guys want to get a little bit of extra stuff, you know, uh, you'll we'll shout you out on our live streams. You can um, get some little bonus content a little bit early and also uh, call into our live streams to chat with us. If you want to join the top level at ten dollars a month, that'll that's something we're really excited to do, uh, you know, kind of interact with you guys, um, you know, do Q&A, stuff like that. So we just figured this would be a good way to engage with our audience and, and you know, get a little bit of support for for doing all this stuff but um yeah feel free to check that out if you guys want and uh if not that's also cool <laughs> yeah gavin and i were a little bit reticent to ever put up a patreon because it's one of those weird things where it's like you know uh what you know uh it's always a little bit weird but we're trying to grow yeah. the channel a little bit trying to uh you know expand the amount of work that we can put into the content that we're doing obviously next year uh when there's a vaccine out and we're able to hit the roads and uh, produce some larger, uh, higher budget uh, content. That kind of thing will be uh, really helpful uh, for getting some uh, more Vanguard on the street content uh, coming out. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, just yeah, figured yeah. we would throw that out into the ether uh, just to, you know, do a little bit of housekeeping for the week. Absolutely. And that is a big part of this too, is what you alluded to. Um, we plan on, you know, going out on the streets in our Sprinter van, which we do have, uh, to, you know, film, make some documentaries, talk to some people. We've done a little bit of that already. You know, you can see our uh, documentary on the People City here in Kansas City, their occupation uh, outside of City Hall. So we have a little bit of a proof of concept in that. Um, if you if you want to see a taste of uh, the kind of documentaries we want to make out on the roads. But, but yeah, that's another reason why we decided to start this uh, Patreon is just that that's going to be so um, expensive and, you know, to travel around and, uh, basically live in a sprinter van when we're making those documentaries and covering protests or campaigns or talking to people, doing whatever. Uh, it's definitely going to be a little bit of money. So yeah, that's why we thought it was uh, time to start the Patreon. But uh, yeah. It, that, yeah. Like, be- I, like we said, times are tough in there. Uh, you yeah. know, obviously would we're not here to make money or, uh, you know, pander for people. So obviously that's, if you, if you're uh, interested in, in throwing, you know, your ex, uh, expendable income towards a good cause and want to see some more lefty commentary get made and produced at a, at a decent quality, you know, hit us up. But obviously it's not imperative. It is not a, there will still be the Vanguard podcast. So anyway, that uh, yeah, kind of, the link for that is in the description, by the way, if anyone is interested, sorry, Zach. Oh no, go ahead. Um, yeah, that was all I was, all I really had to, um, say about that. 
Uh, it's been. It feels like it's been like a crazy week. It's almost like today feels like one of the first days since election. Does that make sense? Have the days been like kind of like moving together? Like I felt like last week, Tuesday through Friday, just felt like one long day, and then it's like finally over the weekend. It's kind of like everybody comes back to reality. Then, you know, all of the news organizations called the election. I don't know. It just feels like the whole country's in like this weird slump with the time change and you know the election and. The lame duck session. I don't know. It just seems like the vibe is a little odd. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit of a, a recalculation, I think, for for everyone, and especially uh, us on the left. You know, I think a lot of people on the left were kind of um, reticent or afraid to really criticize Joe Biden in a robust way or, or the Biden Harris ticket and the administration. But now we're seeing, uh, I think, a lot of people on the left, you know, kind of unchained a little bit from that. Uh, fear, you know, of, you know, hurting Joe Biden and helping Donald Trump accidentally by saying something. So uh, I agree. It's definitely now that the election's over, uh, it, it feels like everyone's kind of recalculating what, what to do next, where to go next. And of course, underneath it all, we have uh, the insanity, which is that Trump is, you know, refusing to concede, refusing to accept the results of the election and all that. So that's, that's also making things weird because, you know, normally after an election, we do have a, a smooth and peaceful uh, transfer of power. And, and so far, that's not really uh, quite coming to fruition. I mean, at least not in the traditional sense. I, I'm not of the belief necessarily that, you know, Trump's going to be successful with his stupid, uh, dumb coup, but it's definitely weird. I mean, it's definitely not normal. Yeah, it's, I mean, uncouth would, I I, I don't know. It's like, it's so, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, it, it's so like unacceptable, like gauche behavior from a president, right? Like it's so, something that's like out of the realm of reality for most, but that's kind of what Trump is. I think that sort of defines the Trump era, this norm shattering barbarism, conceited yeah. narcissistic personality disorder that has made it to the highest order of power in our country. And I think that speaks volumes as we've gotten into in the past, but I think that this is the, what other behavior would you expect from Donald Trump? He's cle what he's clearly doing in my view. I don't think he has any uh, real, intention of like cooing it up like i just don't think he i think he knows that it's it's not going to happen so what i think he's doing is he's he's really like stirring up his base right before he leaves uh so that he can cash in on them with his media empire so that yeah it's all about the money right money 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 we all know donald trump right his theme song for the apprentice said everything you need to know about him but I, I, I wholeheartedly think that that's what this is. I think he's he's trying to get this rabid base together so that he can, you know, do the One American News Network, uh, Fox News angle. Um, whether or not that's going to be a successful venture, I don't know. I, I, I have a lot of faith that Trump himself as a media figure will be successful in that lane. But uh, as far as expanding into a whole empire of media, Trump just doesn't have the track record of being a good businessman. I mean, you know, so it's one of those things where it's like, uh, will he be able to compete if he tries to go to war with Fox News or should he really just start something where it's good for his ego and he goes on Fox News and spreads a bunch of conspiracy theories as, you know, the former president? Um, I don't know what's going to go down with that. But my projection is that this is all a, a game play for media uh, yeah. uh, market share. I think that whether or not he succeeds in actually creating a media company has a lot to uh, depends a lot on if he's able to kind of poach some of Fox News's best. You know, there's there's been talks of him taking uh, Sean Hannity or Tucker, Tucker Carlson, who he's close with, uh, you know, poaching him for his own network. Uh, so we could see something like that begin to brew. But I do think this is what is ultimately the end path uh, to all of this chaos. Um, uh, I did want to. Yeah, I just think if I'm Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson, I don't take that deal. Yeah. Well, who knows? Anyway. Uh, I did notice that our uh, good friend of the show, Kamali Rose, has just joined the stream. So, um, yeah, we're about to uh, add on Kamali Rose from Radical Democracy. Welcome to the show, Kamali. How's it hey, going? What's, what's up, on, guys? What's up, Zach? What's up, Gavin? How's it going, guys? It's, it's all right, man. How are you? I'm pretty good. Not too bad. Not too bad. Let me know if y'all can't hear me. All right. I got a new setup going. And so, you know, if, if you need me to get a little louder here, I can make myself a little louder. Just say the word. No, you sound good to me, man. Sounds nice and yeah. clean. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot to talk about. And before we get into some of these topics that we have uh, laid out, I just wanted to give a chance for you to basically introduce yourself to any of our listeners, any of our audience that's not totally familiar with you or your channel. I uh, just wanted to give a little bit of info for anyone that's watching. Uh, Kamali Rose is the content editor for the Tim Black Show, the host of the Radical Democracy Show on YouTube and Twitch. Links in the description, by the way. 
Uh, he covers news and politics from a black socialist perspective. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at OnToTheFifth, spelled out F-I-F-T-H. And you can support him on Patreon for as low as a dollar a month. That uh, link is also in the description box. So make sure to check out Kamali's uh, you know, channel, his content guys, he makes some amazing stuff. We really enjoy your commentary and we really enjoy uh, talking to you a couple months ago when we did a stream together and, and we're super excited to have the opportunity once again to uh, break down some news, you know, just get your thoughts on some stuff. And and uh, Zach and I are probably gonna be streaming for a couple hours tonight, but at any point in the night, if you got a dip, totally cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate that, guys. Um, you know, uh, you said, you know, most of most of what there is about me there. Um, do some content editing, some video editing for the Tim Black show for their, for them to post clips to Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, so that's a cool gig there. Tim Black is essentially like he, you know, self-described most watched uh, black independent left media figure. Um, so that's really cool experience. And then also uh, I have a show that I do here on YouTube and Twitch called the Radical Democracy Show, where, I, you know, as you mentioned there, I just cover, uh, you know, news, politics, economics through a black leftist socialist uh, lens and try to, you know, we also bring on, we have a Patreon community. So we try to bring on our Patreon patrons as guests from time to time. Uh, they're spread out around the world. So it gives us a good perspective and lets us talk to some of the, you know, just working class folks. Um, you know, we had when the while wildfires were raging through California and and the West Coast, we had a guest on from Seattle, one of our Patreon members. So we do um, we had another Patreon member come and debate the topic of uh, you know is Jimmy Dore a good for the left? Um, so that was fun uh, fun discussion and, and debate. So um, we've done a lot with that, and then we're also trying to simultaneously build a democratic workplace, which is one of our main focuses. We believe you know we are a 21st century socialist, as Richard Wolff would describe, and and we believe in workplace democracy, one worker, one vote on all major decisions, you know, who gets to work, what we do for work, where we work, uh, what gets done with the profits of our labor. We believe in democracy and we want to build that into the media space. And so to build independent left democratic media, um, because we do believe in the concept of dual power and the fact that our institutions are failing us right now. Congress, police, uh, you know, the, the White House, all of our institutions, uh, the judiciary, look at the Supreme Court these institutions are failing us right now the people are aware of it if you look at the you know the approval rating for congress or the judiciary and people are aware of this and we believe that you know new institutions new democratic institutions need to be built in their place and so we're trying to do that uh, and also try to form a united left try to try to you know focus on encouraging and advocating for a united left because i really want to just see the left win and we need to start winning and uh, you know, I, I, I really love what you guys are doing. Congrats on getting the Patreon set up. Um, I saw Susan Sarandon out there, like uh, that was wild. Like you guys should be quite proud of that. That's an amazing one. So that's really cool guys. So congrats on you guys have had some really great content recently. And so I'm um, always keeping an eye out and really love what you guys are doing as well. So thank you so much for having me on. Really appreciate that guys. Oh yeah, for sure, man. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for uh, that. And we're obviously we've been uh, big fans of your show as well. I guess just to kind of dive in here for the day, I want to get your kind of pulse on everything that we're experiencing right now. Obviously, we're a few days out after the elections have been finally called by all major news networks. Uh, obviously, President Trump is about is reacting uh, about how I would expect, right? Like a petulant child, like a kid that doesn't want to go home when he's told to, right? Um, do you think that uh, this is a serious coup attempt that we should be worried about? Or do you think that this is another one of the eye roll kind of like disappointing uh, you know, childish tantrums from the White House. Yeah, I think that if you've been following Trump closely, uh, as folks like the, us are forced to do for the past few years, this shouldn't come as really any surprise to anyone, really. Uh, this is exactly what I expected from him. I honestly, I'm not 100% against him. I actually believe that, like, in the case of, like, Al Gore conceding the election too early when he was, you know, back in 2000, like, that was a time when I actually would be, you know, my principal stance would be, yes, fight it out until all the votes are counted you know like make sure all the votes are counted that's how democracy works you know if as long as he's you know so far everything that he's doing is through legal recourse you know it's all through like legal recourse it's fine it's like you know what that's what i would want if if it were bernie sanders running and the, the race was as close as it was i mean we're talking about razor thin margins in some of those states georgia pennsylvania he's challenged you know that the, the 
He's asking for a recount in Wisconsin. So, you know, it's it's the Democrats' fault, honestly, for, for leaving it that close by running such a terrible candidate um, that it's even as close as it was. And uh, but no, I do not take any like anything that seriously. I don't believe that there will be any type of serious coup attempt from Donald Trump. I just think that he's, you know, he's he's doing what it, what is expected of him. I think that honestly, I don't really believe that he wanted to be president in the first place, to be fully honest. And I think that he's really trying to parlay this just into Trump TV, essentially. Um, and he'll be content doing whatever makes him money. He's still going to have outsized power in the Republican Party. Like, let's be clear, like he's if, to folks that think that Donald Trump is going away after this, like Donald Trump isn't going anywhere. He's his Twitter still is going to work. You know, he's still got, you know, 70 million people just went out there and voted for Donald Trump. So they're all around us, the people that believe in what he believes in, they're still there. They're half of the electorate and they're still going to be a force to be reckoned with. And I think Donald Trump will still be a force to be reckoned with. He's going to have kingmaker powers in the Republican Party. It's the party of Trump, essentially. And so I do think that he, you know, we're not going to see the end of him, but I do think that he will, you know, go quietly into the night when the time comes. I do expect him to never actually say the words I concede. I don't think that he'll ever say those words for us. So, you know, to the folks that are like, heartbroken over norms, um, you know, they'll all be shattered by it. But I, I, I honestly just don't think with him, like you said, he's a petulant child. He's not going to be able to, to, to formulate those words. But when the time comes, I do believe he will have to go like everyone before Fox News and other organizations are like all of Fox News has already come out and made it clear that they are no longer siding with him in that regard. And you even got people like, um, oh, I forget her name, the shut up and dribble lady. I forget her name right now. Um, Oh, you yeah. Know. Laura Ingram, right? It, yes, Laura Ingram, um, you know, even came out and, and did this real this piece where she really like tried to play to his like ego and say like, oh, Donald Trump, he's going to do the great thing that he should do and he's going to concede gracefully. Oh. And, and so, yeah. Well, that's interesting you mentioned that because a lot of people have, uh, you know, floated names like Tucker Carlson as potential people that might run in 2024. And even Laura Ingram herself, I've heard in the conversation as someone who might be an unexpected uh, kind of contender for the Republican tr primary in 2024. So I think a lot of people, a lot of Republicans that might otherwise uh, be a lot more supportive of the president in this moment, um, they're just ready to throw him under the bus because they want to they want to get in there next. You know, the 2024 primary is going to be huge. It's going to be, yeah, I think it's as big as the Democratic primary unless, unless Trump runs again, which is extremely possible. And in that case, he just, I think, kind of bulldozes the competition, which will be hilarious to watch because like I said, <laughs> Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, all these fools. Nikki they, Haley. Nikki Haley. Yeah, they all want it so bad. And they're all, uh, you know, under the assumption that Trump was just going to kind of go into the night or or whatever. Uh, Mike Pence, too. That'll be interesting. Would Mike Pence run against his, uh, you know, former uh, running mate? Who knows? That would hand be that feet. Yeah, Kamali, do you think he runs again in 2024? That would make him, you know, like if he did, he, he's already said, he's already floated the idea. So this isn't just us like, you know, yeah. conspiracy theorizing or anything no. like that. Like he's already floated this idea already. And so this is like that. I, I wasn't expecting that and hadn't thought of it until he he actually said it and, and made it a reality. Um, I think that he would still have a, a real shot. Um, and I know that his ego might not let him, you know, want to walk away as a, you know, one term president that's going to hurt. Uh, his his ego for sure, and so I do. I I'm. I, it won't. I won't put it past him. Like it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, I think that he also might just be fine as long as he's the one that feels like he's you know the kingmaker. He's the one that's that's really picking whoever he endorses as long as they like lick the boot and, and kiss the ring. Um, then I I could see him you know standing back and and trying to wield power in that way uh, and just parlaying again this into media deals and things like that um, for the president as long as he's got he's making money he'll be content so uh i do see it as a as a real possibility for 2024 that he might come back into it um but honestly i'm more afraid of a tucker carlson or a josh hawley or tom cotton presidency really josh hawley isn't even the worst me tom cotton you know um i agree with some of the some of the economic messaging and 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 platform of even a josh holly and he has yeah josh holly's a, and, and as, a, as a local missourian i may have a, i may be a little bit prickly towards uh josh holly you know uh you know because he does walk the walk right but he, he he you know he'll talk about economic uh populism he'll talk about how we need to rein in silicon valley and then he'll happily go into the night and vote for trump's uh you know corporate tax slushery he has no spine i mean he'll just go down with the exact i mean it's kind of like 
Tucker Carlson, right? Like uh, you can celebrate him for pointing out like one populist thing, but you get, I mean, you, you, the entire uh, Trump campaign corruption that, or, I mean, uh, administration corruption that he never covered. So he's, I feel like it's just one of those kinds of deals where, I mean, he's just like another fake progressive to the left, right? Like he, he, another fake progressive to the right, uh, Josh Hawley. But anyway, definitely not as dangerous as Tom Cotton, I agree. Yeah, yeah, sort of like a Rand Paul type that will talk the talk, but when yeah. it comes down to it, he votes down the line Republican. And that's the really, I think, should be the how we remember the Trump presidency is that is is something similar. You know, he had he had this faux populist messaging and he ran on a, you know, on a populist, a right wing, a right populist uh, platform of, you know, we're going to bring the jobs back. We're going to bring all the jobs back. We're going to, you know, we're not going to, you're not, we're not going to take away your social security or your Medicare. You know, he said, we're not going to touch it. All these other Republicans, they want to touch it. But when he got into power, he governed like a, an establishment Republican, you know, he, he, he filled his cabinet with a bunch of establishment, you know, Republican figures, Wall Street, you know, exec Steve Mnuchin, uh, what was it, Gary Cohn, uh, you know, these these high, you know, top level economic positions. So he really governed like a run of the mill standard Republican tax cuts for the rich. I mean, that's all he really accomplished. And then he had a few, you know, he would throw some red meat to the base with the, you know, Muslim ban and, 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 and you know, the concentration camps and the way that he would talk about ICE. But I think that by and large, Donald Trump was a run of the mill Republican in the way that he governed. And I think that we're going to get my fear is that we get something, somebody that agrees with all, Trump on all of the policies, but they don't say the quiet part out loud. You know, they're going to know they're going to be more, you know, they, they'll be more competent. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll be more slick in their, in their rhetoric and they'll, but they'll be able to accomplish much more than Donald Trump was able to accomplish because even he ran into a lot of roadblocks because of his buffoonery and like calling the Muslim ban, a Muslim ban out loud you know, got it blocked from in the courts for a long time. And his so. own beef with John McCain likely cost him his ability to pass his, uh, you know, repeal and replace o Obamacare. I mean, it wasn't as if, you know, Donald Trump had come in as a buttoned up Republican that John McCain has this like ethical reason why he wants Americans to have health care. He doesn't give a fuck about regular, or didn't, I should say, you know, uh, give a fuck about regular Americans. But it was his personal feud with the president that made him, you know, go on MSNBC and be this like liberal stalwart that was going to, you know, prevent the devastation of Donald Trump. And, you know, a lot of that was just his own ego and his like, you know, fuck you to the president. Right. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, and I think that another thing that we have to reckon with for the left especially is that I think that we may witness and we're likely to witness an even further shift to the right for the Democratic Party because what they're they're already sort of signaling already, you know, that that they're more comfortable with say a John Kasich than a a AOC, you know, and they and they and they they definitely have already signaled that. Uh, you know, just look at the DNC and in in the way that you know the, the amount of time John Kasich was given versus uh, AOC, you know, sixty seconds pre recorded. Um, but also, I think that what we have to look at is that what what what's about to happen, you know, for these next few years. We have the situation has been set up, you know, quite c conveniently for for Joe Biden. He ran on a completely substanceless. You know, he had no platform. He didn't run on any policy. He ran on I'm not Donald Trump. And now what we're looking at is, you know, a, a Biden presidency with a Republican controlled Senate, most likely those, you know, the races in Georgia, the runoffs in Georgia are more likely to go. One of those seats are more like, you know, are, are, are very likely to go to a Republican. If they do, they'll maintain control over the Senate. Um, I would love to see a, a, a Democratic majority so we could really hold their feet to the fire and say, look at now you can't use that as an excuse anymore. Um, and so uh, if if the, if we have a Republican Senate, they're going to have an excuse built in now that they can say, oh, you see a guy, sorry, we couldn't accomplish anything. It was those 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 obstructionist Republicans blocking us all the while that will ignore the fact that there is a ton of executive orders that that Biden could do. He could legalize cannabis. He could cancel all student debt. David Dayan did a great piece in the, the American Prospect um, called The Day One Agenda that everyone should check out that really lays out about 277, I think, uh, executive orders that that would have come out of those task forces. And we'll see, you know, what actually gets done. I, I have no faith in Biden doing any of that. And if we get a, if, if they accomplish nothing for the next two years, while they're being, you know, so-called obstructed by the Republicans in the Senate, and then the, and then we get to those midterm elections, they're going to have the Republicans are going to have a ton to run on. They already just lost five seats in the House. 
we could be looking at losing the house and you know and letting the Re republicans take back a comfortable majority in the senate uh and that then leading up to for the next two years and so what we might see is four years of no nothing being accomplished by the democrats and then imagine what the the messaging is going to be out of the republican party in four years when the when the democrats have accomplished nothing we we're going to be ravaged by covid and you know and the the economic depression that we're in right now and you know i i really fear what the democrats are going to be able to you know what the republicans are going to be able to message on in 2024 and coming out there i think that they're going to have a strong case to make and there's going to be that pendulum is is likely to swing back with the democrats not accomplishing anything and that's my biggest fear is that we get a that there's a real strong chance for a tom cotton or even a donald trump 2024 to come back and and, and take this thing back and then they're going to be telling progressives in the left Listen, they're already telling us, you know, they're already lining up and say, okay, well, you can't say anything about progressive policies for now because these runoffs are coming up. And then after the runoffs happen, they're going to say, all right, guys, you know, we're already heading into the midterms. You can't say anything. Don't don't use that Medicare for all or that defund the police talk. You know, it's going to be bad messaging, all that socialist rhetoric yeah, for those midterms. Did you see John Ossoff's Axios video where he basically went down the line, no, 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 on every- I don't support exciting, that. I don't support that. I don't support yeah, that. <laughs> like any potentially exciting measure that could actually get uh, like progressive Georgians to the polls, just like, nope, I don't support. Like, so it, why even elect- Music to David Perdue's ears. Why even elect a Democrat uh, to the Senate if they're not in favor of any of that stuff? And I mean, obviously there are, uh, you know, policy differences. I'm not going to pretend there aren't, but, uh, and I did want to get your opinion on, on that, uh, Georgia runoffs, you know, um, it, it does look like the Senate control, the democratic control of the Senate rather, uh, which a lot of people were banking on, uh, ourselves included here at the Vanguard. I mean, we were predicting it even despite the lousy, uh, strategy of the Democrats, which we always acknowledged. Uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, the miscalculation was that we thought the Democrats were better than they, uh, were, it was just that, uh, I think a lot of people, um, probably figured COVID into the equation a little bit more than, uh, necessary or a few other factors, but, but yeah, it, it does look like the, the Senate is going to come down to Georgia. Uh, do you have any faith that the Democrats can pull this off at all, Kamali? None whatsoever. I mean, we're talking about, you know, in a, a an off, you know, election, it's not going to be in the general, you know, so we, they don't have, we just saw, I feel like Biden is elected and now we have a large set of our, you know, so-called liberal allies that, are already out to brunch. You know, they're they're already gone to brunch at this point. And so I I I really don't see a a you know Joe Biden doesn't have a strong grassroots movement behind him. And so I I really worry I don't believe at all that they're going to pull off both of those seats in Georgia. It's just the the turnout if you look at past, you know, off elections or runoff elections in Georgia, um, you know, Republican turnout is higher in those elections. And so I think that it's all signs point to at least one of those seats going to uh, going to the Republicans and then maintaining control. And that's all they need. And I think that's the likely scenario and the likely outcome. And let's be real. I think that's what Democrats want. Like um, at the People's Convention, Chang Sim Lim, a Medicare for All activist, spoke at the, the People's Convention. Yeah. And she talked about this and this issue and the fact that this isn't an accident. This is the strategy when the Democrats are, you know, uh, are, are out of power and they're the opposition party, they will message on progressive policy because they know it plays well to the base because they know it's popular policy, even in Georgia and South Carolina in states where 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 Biden won the election, Medicare for all polled with majority support for all people, not just. Democrats, but Democrats, independents and Republicans, but particularly with Democrats. And that's an 88 percent, you know, Democrats support that policy. Um, but they 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 don't you know, they 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 run away from that messaging. They run away from that, even though it's popular. And so I that's why I, Biden lost Florida. I mean, think about it. Right. It's it's the perfectly evidence. I mean, not only did all of this, uh, like we talked about, the, the Congress people who endorsed Medicare for all, they were all reelected. Yeah. Um, you have 60% of the people vote to affirm $15 minimum wage in Florida, and yet Joe Biden uh, can't seem to pull it out of the bag when that's a policy that he supports, supposedly. Supposedly. Right? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, just to take it back to the special election race in Georgia, not that long ago, even Tucker Carlson was hammering Kelly Loeffler because of her, you know, basically criminal and if not criminal, unconscionable behavior in regards to the private uh, or the information that she got in regards to the COVID-19 crisis, which she used to uh, personally, uh, you know, enrich, enrich herself. herself. Yeah. 
Yeah, in a time of crisis, which like you know, if a guy like Tucker Carlson is calling you out for being a corrupt piece of shit, and you're a Republican, you really better take a look in the mirror. So why <laughs> the Democrats aren't using that to cut footage and have Tucker Carlson hammering Kelly Loeffler twenty four seven? Uh, 365 with all the money that they should have saved on Jamie Harrison because he was never going to fucking win his race in a million years. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, they do this. And, and I, I truly believe this is intentional. I think it's why they were they put so much energy behind uh, Amy McGrath in, you know, in that Kentucky race to in the primary, especially I think that they 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 stole Charles that Booker had a chance. Charles Booker. Yeah, I think they closed about it was like 99% of the polling places in Louisville and had two two polling places out of like hundreds left open in the middle of a pandemic and i think that it was all intentional uh you know intentional voter suppression because they know when when you suppress the vote the the more the further to the right you know the further right candidate tends to benefit from a you know voter suppression so in that case you know Charles Booker being left you know Amy McGrath being the right candidate she ran as a trump Democrat, you know, as a pro Trump Democrat, that was going to be more pro Trump than Mitch McConnell, which I don't even know how that's possible. How's that humanly possible? Um, but uh, yeah, this is a strategy. And this is what Cheng Sun Lim talked about at the People's Convention is their strategy is that they, when they're when they're when they're not in power, they will speak as if they, they they support these policies. But as soon as they get into power, they completely flip on this. They did it with the public option, um, you know, uh, under Obama, when, when, when Cheng Sun Lim was fighting for it. And they'll do it again with all of these policies like Kamala Harris. She she supported Medicare for all uh, Green New Deal during the primaries. And supported. then as soon, exactly as soon as they as soon as they questioned her on it, you know, and, and, and followed up on it. Oh, I raised my them. hand wrong exactly i heard that i misheard the question you know and so uh Whatever. you know and she just continues to shift to the right and so this 15 dollars minimum wage I, I it was the one part of the debates of of joe biden the one moment that i was like hmm, so, that that's not bad you know if if he actually did that you know prove me wrong and do that but you know joe biden and barack obama were in power for eight years when they came into power the minimum wage was seven dollars and 25 cents when they left power the minimum wage was seven dollars and 25 cents so if you really truly believed in that if you really truly believed in that and, and 15 dollars, let's be real that's an outdated policy like Poverty 15 dollars that is I heard somebody say it recently. We're not, that's just, we're just talking about getting people. Corey Bush said it recently on, on, on an interview, I think on MSNBC, she said, it's, we're not even talking, it's not talking about making people rich. We're talking about going from starvation to living. Like that's it. Like it's just from starvation to living is all that $15 an hour gets you. And what we should be. And I talked about this back in 2016 after, or in 2017, right after, uh, uh, Hillary lost. I said I started saying, listen, we need to re, you know, recon reconfigure our messaging for 2020. And we should be talking about instead of a fight for 15, we should be talking about 20 in 2020. Like we should be talking about a $20 minimum wage by 2020 because if we kept up with inflation, it would be $22 an hour. So yeah, when I, 22 is a good slogan, it, it, too. Exactly. And if you really believed in a $15 minimum wage, you would be talking about a $20 minimum wage right now or $22 in, in, in hammering that messaging because you know you're going to have to ultimately go and compromise something. So when you already go to the table, to the negotiating table with a compromised position, you don't. I, I don't feel like you're really going to win anything out of that. And so maybe they go and maybe they claim that they support, maybe he supports a $15 minimum wage. Maybe we get a $10 minimum wage federally or something like that, but maybe we don't get anything and he just blames it on Republican opposition. And I think that that's what they want. And that's why I I don't think that they'll put any real effort. The candidates that he, that they even put up are like your basic establishment Democrats, you know, court, you know, corporate Democrats. They're sort of center right people. And when you have a choice in a in a in a typically red state in a generally red state between a you know Republican and Republican light, why are you going to take the light option when you can just get the real Republican? And so it, I. I I have very little faith, and I honestly think it's by design. It's not by accident for the for the Democrats. Yeah, controlled opposition. Yeah, yeah and and also you're totally right about the um, tying it to inflation. You know, if the Democrats really uh, cared about the minimum wage and about you know making sure that workers weren't being exploited and paid poverty wages, then uh, you know instead of just talking about raising the minimum wage and then in another five years raising the minimum wage and dangling it over voters' head, essentially like, do you want to? Do you want to raise the minimum wage? Do you want to vote for, you're going to have to vote Democrat. Well, they could just tie it to inflation and then it wouldn't even be a policy battle that we constantly have to fight over and over again, spending political capital, wasting our time uh, when it could just be tied to inflation. There's no reason that as the price of products go up and capital corporations get to uh, charge people more for the same shit, that people should, uh, wages should stagnate, which is, as you said, uh, under Obama and Biden didn't go up, under Trump didn't go up. So tie this thing to inflation and we don't have to keep fighting this fight. Uh, yeah. By the way, 
if anyone's watching, just wanted to say, make sure to subscribe and uh, give us a like, check out Kamali's channel as well. We're just breaking down some news over here with a friend of the channel, Radical Democracy. If anyone's uh, just now tuning in, um, if you had something else to say on that, go ahead. I, I wanted to bring up something else too, though. Um, no. No, all I need to say is definitely please hit that like button down below, smash that like button, especially if you're joining here from, from the Radical Democracy you know, audience, definitely make sure you give them a like, follow, subscribe, all the support. We got to support our fellow you know, independent left media. So absolutely, absolutely support these guys. 100%. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Kamali. Really appreciate that. And like I said, if anyone's watching, do the same for uh, your channel. Um, something else that uh, you know has been kind of going on in the background. Not a lot of people have been talking about it, but you know, Biden put out his uh, COVID plan and some people on the left have had some issues with that. Uh, I, I didn't know if you saw this video that just came out or I think she was on a podcast or something, but Ilhan Omar was kind of talking about how she would handle this going into uh, Congress and, and the kind of the legislation that she would be fighting for, um, you know, fighting for a guaranteed income. So uh, I'll try to pull this video up and see if uh, we can play that. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to say to everyone who's watching us, you know, in the next new Congress, um, the 117th Congress, I will be introducing guaranteed income um, nationwide, uh, and it will be tailored. Um, it will be uh, tailoring a plan to the new economic realities we're currently facing because of, of this pandemic, um, and it will hopefully um, allow us to engage this upcoming administration um, and uh, as we push them to leap forward into a future that could be brighter for all of us. Um, you were you guys able to hear that okay? Yeah. 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 Uh, Kamali, that actually leads into a question that I, I wanted to talk to you about a little bit. You know, obviously, that's a big, bold, progressive piece of legislation. Uh, it's exciting to see it, uh, you know, get introduced on the house of congress where it'll inevitably die i'm wondering in that you know and now that we are set up in a with a you know we, we were hopeful on the left i think uh you know perhaps misguidedly hopeful that this would be a, a democratic senate and a democratic congress and kind of you know not have to deal with this whole like oh we, we, we're just not doing anything because of mcconnell like justified impotence from the democratic party i'm wondering what do you think is going to be a, a ineffective resistance if anything from the squad uh newly empowered with a few additional members uh none of the original squad members uh lost their seat uh so it has it has grown albeit not by the margins that i think many of us would have liked to see i just do you think any resistance uh from uh the squad both new and old will be effective um, well, I don't think that people are going to want to hear my, my, you know, discouraging, you know, thoughts here, but, uh, no, honestly, I don't think that there's much that the squad can do. I think that we, they, do, they just don't have the, you know, they're outnumbered. They're, they're vastly outnumbered. They, they just don't have the, the power in Congress that they, that they need to have. Um, you know, we may talk about later some of the, the plans to, uh, restructure the you know the congressional progressive caucus and i think that that could have some impact you know eventually but it's going to sort of be a slow moving process and i think that uh what we're going to have to you know what we need is to to develop a block of uh, you know these Congress people and these House members that is large enough that they can actually, by withholding their their votes, it's significant enough um, that they can actually push for for their policies. And I just don't think that they have that that those numbers right now. And so I do think that w the way that it's going to, you know, the left is going to have to win. And even you know, ultimately, again, like you said, that's to push for you know something in a in a you know in a House that will ultimately never make it past the House. Um, but you know, even if it did, Joe Biden has said on record you know he would veto things like medicare for all he says you know and he's been hostile to a green new deal and so i don't think that there's there's very much hope for a you know the left what the left needs to start to get serious about i think is where we win is winning in primaries. I think that that has to be the focus is we have to start winning primaries. We have to win presidential primaries as well because we need somebody that is favorable to our 
our agenda in the White House because I do think that there are there are, you know the power that comes from that the, the way that you can staff your administration is is extremely important because it's not just you know the day to day is being handled by who is it actually you know in all these positions at the F FDA the EPA you know the the um, SEC and so I don't think that the le the that the squad has enough. Uh, power right now. I think that they did expand, you know, Jamal Bowman, Mondaire Jones, Corey Bush. Corey Bush, like that's, a, that's, these were big expansions. And those were, you know, like AOC, you know, talked about like, it was, it was only the, you know, everyone that supported Medicare for all, they won their primary. So we know these policies are popular policies. Uh, but I think that there's too much hostility to those policies, both in the house within the democratic party, uh, as well as in the White House as well. And so uh, I don't think that they're going to be able to do much as the block that they are. But if they if the changes from, you know, Jayapal, which again, we might get into go through, I think that there is some over time, it can eventually create a situation where they do have that kind of power and, and vote as a block and actually withholding their votes actually has some power. But um, do you think yeah. that the, do you think that the squad is going to resist Pelosi at all as she attempts to become speaker again? Or do you think they're going to basically roll over and let it happen? I think there will be zero, zero resistance. They for, want Mama Bear back in charge. Yeah, yeah. AOC is already, you know, Mama Bear is 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 coming back home, and uh, yeah, I think that she's. They've already said. They've already signaled that nobody's really. There's no challengers to her right now. Um, Akeem Jeffries is floated in. Akeem Jeffries. I mean, the challenges that they're talking about. Akeem Jeffries is terrible. You know, like he's terrible, he's awful. He's just another. You know, yeah. he's he's the same. All those same policies, those neoliberal policies repackaged into a younger, darker package, you know, and that's it. And it's just like, we're going to put a young black face on all these terrible, horrendous, corporatist, neoliberal policies. And that's who Hakeem Jeffries is. He's funded by big pharma, um, you know, any, any, you know, so I just don't, I don't put any, and, you know, Pramila Jayapal, I, I honestly, I don't even think that even folks like Pramila Jayapal, who would be the one, you know, the, the person, I think Barbara Lee or Pramila Jayapal would be the, the, you know, likely contenders that you need somebody with experience. You can't, some people were, you know, I've heard it floated, not by you guys, of course, but people floating like, can a member of the squad challenge Nancy Pelosi? And there's no, that's a net, no chance. They will get no support. Um, and you have to have, you, you have to have the support of the democratic party and the democratic party right now, let's be real is by and large an establishment corporatist party. And so you're not going to get support for a, a progressive right now uh, leading the charge on that. And folks like Barbara Lee and Pramila Jayapal, let's be real, just aren't even willing to challenge Nancy Pelosi. And I'm sure to them, there's some behind the scenes power, you know, you know, struggled going on at play there that we're just too, all of us normies are just too dumb to understand that we can't, you know, and so, but it's like, you know, you got to do something to fight back. And so they, they, they barely mounted a challenge last time and it quickly got, got snuffed out this yeah. time. There's not even been a signaling that they're going to mount a challenge. So I don't see any of that happening. Um, and, and Pelosi might, uh, might run again in two years. So who knows? I mean, she, she might, she'll probably die in that, in, you know, in that seat. So, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty disappointing, especially after all the talk of all the resistance that was going to go down. You know, I mean, it's it just, I mean, what a fall from grace. It feels like, I mean, not that the left was ever soaring high, but just like, God damn, right? If you go from the way that the feeling that you had, that, I mean, I know I had, right? Uh, the night after Nevada with Bernie Sanders and now, and just like the vision for what I thought was possible in this country, just, I mean, you know, and maybe that was naivete, maybe that was, you know, hope and ideology getting in the way of, of a reality that was probably never going to hang out or, you know, come to fruition. But, it, you know, even throughout the, you know, election process with, you know, people like the squad constantly like imploring everybody to vote for Joe Biden and just hang on until November and then the resistance is going to start. And then you just see this complete utter impotence, this lack of action, you know, rolling over like a dog and letting Nancy Pelosi do whatever the fuck she wants while millions of Americans face hunger, eviction. I mean, this is serious shit, right? Like we, a, a lot of us are in a fortune, are in a position where we're at least some degree removed from the horror of all of this. But, you know, occasionally you'll read something, right? And it'll put you right back into reality. I, I was reading a, a piece by Megan Day earlier in Jacobin uh, cr that was critical of uh, a, a kind of like the Twitter philanthropy movement, right? Uh, sons of oligarchs who, you know, get famous on uh, Twitter by giving away $10,000 to desperate people, uh, you know, to make themselves feel like heroes, gods, kings, and all that. 
uh, because they've inherited this mass amount of wealth and, uh, you know, an unjust system. And one of the things that was completely a side point of that piece that really just struck home to me was, you know, just the, 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 the uh, just the, all the different backgrounds of anybody who's been affected by this pandemic. And I think that it's something that I wish that our elected officials in Washington weren't so removed from, um, you know, you have people who are, you know, maybe they've got, you know, three or four children and they were just making ends meet before the pandemic and they were holding down two or three different service jobs, you know, doing the whole breakfast joint, uh, bartending, you know, working as a caterer on the weekend, trying to hold it down for their kids. And on the other hand, you have a woman with, uh, you know, a son with a medical condition and she was a part, uh, she was like a, a guest lecturer at Harvard before the pandemic hit. They laid off all of their, you know, this is a woman with a PhD. So it just shows that everybody from all aspects, all backgrounds, all education levels, we're all being affected by this. And it just, it, it seems as if the Democratic Party just wants to pretend that none of that devastation is happening right now, that we're not in a, you know, 1929 level panic. Um, I don't know. Are you, are you at all surprised, let down? What are your feelings on all that? Yeah, for the squad. I mean, I was a I, I checked it out recently. I, I looked up to see like, um, you know, on the uh, who I forget it. It's I think it's the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, who has like a list of all of the donations. You know, you have to report your your campaign donations to the FEC. And so you can go on this website and you can see in like in order everyone's donations as they as they log them in, in, in their in their books. And I looked up and I was one of the I was one of the first 300 people to ever donate to AOC. Um, it, yeah, yeah. So my name's up on that list. One of the first 300. Um, and I found her early and it was a great feeling, you know, to, for, for her when, when she won, I mean, it felt like we won, you know, it felt like the left really won. And it was, I, I watched it live that day. I cried when she, when she won, you know, I was looking like Van Jones up there, uh, you know, over Biden and stuff. And like, it was, it, it was so emotional. It felt so great. It felt like, okay, we got a working class person, you know, which is, that's the most underrepresented group in Congress is, you know, outside of atheists. Sandy from is, the Bronx. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's the working class, you know, person it's, we got, you know, it's over, you know, uh, just overwhelmingly, uh, you know, wealthy people, millionaires uh, in our Congress. And so they're really out of touch. So it felt great to have these working class people in there. And it just kind of, it, it, what it showed me was one, how much of a gem Bernie Sanders is and how special that dude is. Because to, to sit in Congress for like what is like 40 years, you know, and be unmoved and unwavering on your on your principles like that is it, you know, it's it's just it's he's a unicorn. There's nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. And what it really shows me is that 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 machine is quite a machine. You know, it is when we talk about systems, you know, when we talk about systems, it's like there is a systemic problem here. And when the system is the problem, you can throw amazing people into this system. And if it was, it's a system, it's a machine, it does what it does, you know, and, 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 and it will grind through anyone. And so I'm I'm discouraged for sure by what I've seen out of the Justice Democrats and the, you know, the the so-called squad. Uh, I, you know, I'm I'm my 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 district member was Ayanna Presley. So she's like technically a member of the squad, but she's the worst member of the squad. I mean, she's this video of her like a couple of years back in 2016 talking about how Medicare for all is a pie in the sky dream. And when, a, when the reporter like pushed her on it to be like, wait, 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 that's, you know, that's actually a popular policy. And, you know, it, you know, do you, do you have any worries about, you know, Hillary Clinton's run? She literally called the reporter sexist for like even daring to question Hillary. Clinton. No wonder she went to go uh, endorse Elizabeth Warren. Yes. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm from the, you know, I got Elizabeth Warren on the, like, it's I'm, I just my politicians. We got some of the worst, you know, some of these like faux progressives are, are the brand of Massachusetts are these well, our legislature in Massachusetts is 80% democratic we have a super majority in 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 our you know state house and they can't lift the ban on rent control in the middle of a pandemic they will not lift the ban on rent control so you get all these democrats in and they're just they end up being these establishment democrats so you know i i and i feel like you know some of them were probably you know started out with progressive messaging and and and, and it just the system slowly over time grinds through them and chews them up and they they have to start to play within the rules and that that's one of the issues with trying to play within, you know, and change the system from within a system is 
it may be futile. Cornell West has recently spoken when he's talked at the People's Convention and he's spoken in interviews on CNN. I've seen him on interviews with um, Anderson Cooper saying, you know what, we might need to reckon with the left and, and, you know, in the Democratic Party might need to reckon with the fact that maybe the Democratic Party is too far gone, you know, and it's already just too late and that this machine is, is you know, is is in full is, you know, it's, it's, it's rolling down the hill, you know, it's just like a ball rolling down the hill or a snowball rolling down the hill and you just cannot stop that. And so, uh, you know, the, the squad getting in there, it is discouraging to see what they've, you know, ultimately, you know, done at, with their power. It's, it's, it, it feels like a big letdown for me. I, I do like some of the rhetoric out of state, like Ilhan Omar, I think is pretty solid, you know, by and large. I think that she's been one of my favorite members of the squad. Ilhan Omar, uh, Rashida Tlaib have been the stronger uh, candidates. And I honestly think it comes from some of their background and, you know, Ilhan yeah, they Omar. haven't pulled any fuck shit on Israel. That's for exactly, sure. exactly. And stood their ground. And AOC has been really disappointing to me, honestly because she didn't endorse Cory Bush, you know? Um, yeah. She, yeah, which was like, uh, just what, just what a disrespectful move to somebody you called your friend. Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, but anyway. How far removed is she from, from, from 2018 when, when, you know, she couldn't get a, an endorsement from anyone in Congress except for Ro Khanna, who did a dual endorsement of Joe Crowley. Yeah and AOC and she saw the struggle and the challenge when you got no when you're when you got no support from the inside what the hell is the point of getting them inside if once they're inside they don't do what we want them to do you know so like I, I'm not going to totally tear down the squad and AOC they're better than any other Democrats of course but I just think that maybe just maybe you know they're drinking the Kool-Aid Exactly. In this like idea that we can change the system from the within the system, it might just be too far gone. It's why I advocate and I really strongly advocate for things like I just feel like that demo that so-called democracy, that sham of a democracy that's, you know, riddled with things like the, the electoral college, you know, just these convoluted systems um these inherently anti-democratic systems that maybe that entire system is just too far gone and that we have to start to work from outside of it into you know it's a capitalist structure and you know it was built and developed under a capitalist system and you know even nancy pelosi has said you know we're a capitalist party we're both you know every we're all capitalists here and so i think that uh, you know that's why one of the reasons why i advocate so strongly for building democracy in the workplace because i really think that if we really want to experience democracy and and, and take back control of our democracy that maybe that this sham of a democracy that you know this that has been narrowed to just voting in elections every two to four years essentially and that concept of democracy has been so narrowed to just th that's how it's defined at this point um that we actually need to start to on the left build up you know real democratic institutions in in place of these things because you know look at examples like Mondragon, what they were able to do. I mean, we've been fighting, voting for the lesser of two evils. Bri Brianna Joy Gray talked about this recently, um, and she's been really hammering this point home about, you know, the the uh, the idea of like, you know, pushing Biden to the left, as well as like the voting for the lesser of two evils that we keep on doing over and over. And that she was saying on uh, the Katie Halper show recently, and, and also uh, uh, she did a, she had an interview on Tim Black's show. Um, that was a really great interview. And she talked about it with Tim Black, just saying like the black folks have been voting for the Democratic Party for the last, you know, 40 years since the civil rights movement, you know, they keep voting for the Democratic Party in, in out, like overwhelming numbers, you know, they, they talk about the black vote, but like, you know, black vote, black, the black vote was the least to, to vote. You know, they, they had the, the highest numbers for the Democratic Party. You know, 90 percent of black people turned out for the Democratic Party and they're not getting anything for that vote. And so, um, you know, it's just I think that people it starts to discourage people after a while and people become cynical. They 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 check out of politics. They 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 feel, you know, like the system has left them behind. And that largest block of voters that we the people that we really care about are disproportionately non voters um, are marginalized people. And I think that we need to start to do something and start to build something on the left where we start to reach those people and actually help those people and, and, and start to build institutions in their place. I think what the black socialists in America are doing is a powerful woman trying to build new power. The cooperation Jackson in uh, Mississippi and Jackson, Mississippi building uh, power through 
you know, developing worker cooperatives and give people a real taste of democracy. Um, because I don't think any of us have actually experienced real democracy. In a real democracy, you would you would vote for the people who represented your beliefs, and then when we all voted in those people, if a majority of us supported a policy, then that policy would be enacted. But there's a Princeton study that showed that no matter what the public opinion was on a policy, uh, it didn't actually affect the outcome of that policy, the likelihood of that policy to actually pass through Congress. So I think that we've lost control of the democracy there. And I think that maybe, just maybe, you know, it's time for the left to start building uh, power outside of the, those institutions, outside of just electoralism. I don't think that we completely cede power in electoral politics to the right, but I do think that we need to start to have a multi-pronged approach and also supporting things like the People's Party and, you know, movements like that, where we can start to try to push from outside of the Democratic Party institution, because I fear that it's this is a machine that just chews people up and spits them out. And even if they go in as, as strong fighters, ultimately, they're 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 whittled down by all of these, you know, the norms and the and the, and yeah. the power players. Yeah, I totally I totally agree. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought up Brianna Joy, Greg, because I always uh, love to reference her amazing Peace and Current Affairs uh, in Defense of Litmus Test, where, of course, she, you know, basically explains how this whole logic of voting for the lesser of two evils, you know, it, it's led to a Democratic Party that was willing to embrace uh, Michael Bloomberg. And uh, as their nominee, you know, people uh, saying that they would support him had he won the nomination. I'm not comfortable voting for uh, Michael Bloomberg. Uh, I, I'm comfortable voting for a Democrat if it's like Bernie Sanders or something. But I'm just I, I mean, I wasn't even comfortable voting for Joe Biden. But at the rate the Democratic Party is going right now, uh, they're going to nominate fucking John Kasich in 2024. Like, I'm not even I'm not even shitting you. That's where the Democratic Party is heading you. They're going to learn the wrong lesson over and over again until they're sufficiently right wing enough so that they can nominate John Kasich and, you know, tell the left, uh, to go fuck themselves, which is why I am 100%, you know, in favor of uh, the movement for a people's party and the work that's being done by so many activists and other organizations as well to, you know, try to uh, separate us from the Democratic Party or, uh, you know, establishment and all that stuff to try to uh, get away from that so we can hopefully break free and start anew. Obviously, that's a that's a tough challenge, but um, I, I think that, yeah, Brianna Joy Gray just remains one of the best messengers in that regard. Um, one other thing I wanted to get your reaction to, Kamali, because we were just talking about AOC and, and specifically AOC in relation to Cori Bush. Um, uh, AOC has this interview out in the New York Times, which a lot of people have been um, really, you know. Oh, and oh, just before we uh, jump off of this uh, really quickly, I, I did want to ask you just for uh, while we're staying on the topic of democracy and, and the uh, direct action of voters. Uh, you said your home state's Massachusetts, correct? You guys just had the ballot initiative on ranked choice voting. That's something that Gavin and I have been uh, talking about uh, a little bit. I just wondered if you could quickly uh, just kind of give your reaction to that and maybe talk about the messaging uh, on that um, before we it, move on. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. We we lost. We, 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 we had ranked choice voting on the ballot, direct ballot measure. Um, I thought for sure, you know, I, I was I was a strong advocate for, you know, uh, voting yes on two for, you know, a yes on ranked choice voting. I advocated with everybody that I knew. I pushed a lot of people over. There was a ton of misinformation going around. Um, and what the reality is that the 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 people that are against democracy, they tend to be the people that have, you know, they they've benefited from the system as it is, and they want to keep it the same. And so they don't want to let in a so-called tyranny of the majority, and they don't want to actually let the public, you know, have a have an actual democratic say and democratic control over their institutions. And so they, and they're the people with, they're the money people. So they have, they have the money to go and do all, you know, they flood the airwaves with, you know, the, these, this propagandistic, you know, messaging. It was just all, you know, oh, it's, it confuses voters was the messaging that was, that was the, the, prime messaging. Um, and I saw people on the left, you know, that were, I, I saw one person that was working the polls who said, you know, oh, I went in and I voted yes on ranked choice. But actually, when I saw the, the way that people are so confused in just voting without ranked choice voting, I no longer support it because I, that's just going to add confusion to it. So they, they were able to really message and, and, and propagandize against it. And it's it's one of the things that we have to, you know, Maine passed it not too long ago and we're able to vote out their racist governor, um, Paul LePage, I think his name is. And I, it was really it was a it was a painful thing to watch to be honest because uh you know i thought that the activists and the folks i think that if we honestly i think covid hurt us a lot because uh, you know, we weren't able to do door-to-door -door campaigning on the issue for it. And it's the kind of thing where, 
you get a lot of support for, uh, you know, grassroots activists that will support that measure and they can't donate, you know, they don't have million piles of money to donate and so that you can flood the airways with advertising. But where our power really lies is in the power of the people. You know, they have the money, we have the people. And what we really w needed to be able to do was to go and door knock on this issue and to, you know, to really campaign on this issue. And we just weren't able to do it. So I think that COVID uh, really hurt the left. And I think this is something that we talked about even when we, when, when I had you on, on, on the show um, way back then is we both were talking about you know the pandemic ultimately uh being a boon to sort of the status quo and really hurting progressives that needed to do the grassroots activism and so yeah i think that that was what really affected it was the inability to go out there and to campaign door to door um and just the 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 the, uh, the pouring in of of money on the opposite side um for advertising it was just they flooded the airwaves with 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 false messaging uh, you know, to to claim that it was a confu you know, would cause confusion, uh, and 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 you know, and they yeah. used the the San Francisco or the Oakland um, uh, election as as an example to try to as a scare tactic as well for people. And and with these ballot measures, uh, since it's not like a, a candidate necessarily running, uh, more dark money and more of these sketchy. Um, you know, billionaires and, you know, the oil industry when it or the pharmaceutical industry when it comes to weed, uh, you know, various industries can kind of get in and kind of sow this misinformation and and kind of just like you said, flood the airwaves with propaganda. Two hundred million dollars on Prop 22 in California. Yeah. So yeah. it's pretty crazy how a lot of these ballot measures, you know, they're basically um, and, and, and Zach and I have advocated for ballot measures. Usually we think it's probably one of the most efficient ways to actually get shit done, because obviously, you know, the Congress isn't going to isn't going to legalize weed in all these states. The Congress isn't going to pass ranked choice voting in Maine. So, yeah, we're 100 percent for ballot measures, but it, it is truly insane the amount of uh, money that these measures are often up against when it comes to uh, even something as simple as uh, ranked choice voting, which, you know, sounds so fucking logical to someone like me or you. I mean, it's how they, it's how they vote on the Academy Awards. It's how the best picture is decided. Everyone's familiar with that. It should be, uh, you know, the most logical way to make a, a, a popular decision ever, but uh, there's so much misinformation out there. Uh, there's so much propaganda that, yeah, that, that really does suck. And, and again, it's something that uh, it's tough to even um, have a, a real resistance to, because it's not like um, there's a bunch of you know, huge industries that are reliant on ranked choice voting passing or uh, weed being legalized or any of these progressive priorities. It's and it, it seems like. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just said it's all the corporations that want to see these things fail, and it's the people that want them to pass. And obviously, the corporations are always going to outnumber the people when it comes to money. Yeah, yeah. and it's it seems like they have the way of taking these massively popular things and finding a way to manipulate the lobbyists to get them worded on the ballot in the most con in the most confusing way, but also the most unpopular way possible. Like, how do you take something like should these workers have rights and make it sound unpopular? That's exactly how they worded Prop Twenty Two. Yeah. How do you take like, yeah. and then you have the massive campaign to take something else that. Uh, people are desperate for like rent control in a place like California, right? Where you have uh, markets like uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, where it, it is literally almost impossible to find uh, affordable housing if you're a working class family, uh, right? And and rent control would have uh, would have done a, a lot for people in that situation, doesn't pass, right? And it's, and it's uh, baffling to me, but it's also, we have to, it just kind of ev is evidence of how persuasive uh, media and marketing can be. And I don't think it's the people that are in any way being like the working people who voted for uh, prop. Yes. On prop 22. I think a lot of them just fell for the messaging that this is how you help workers. Like, Oh, this is going to hurt workers. Cause every time I like, you know, I ride Uber every day. If I, I'm not saying I do, but if I did, I see that message prop 22 is going to make my wait times longer. It's going to make drivers have less flexibility. They're going to have lower pay. My ride price is going to go up, you know? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm just a regular person that uses Uber. Like, oh, fuck, I better, you know, thanks for the warning, Uber. Like, I'll make sure to vote for that, right? And, you know, obviously there was tremendous, uh, uh, amazing work done by gig worker organizing and in California trying to pierce that messaging. But when you're going up against $200 million in a platform that's already in the pocket of so many millions of Americans, uh, yeah, it, it's a big task. Do you think that there's any way that you can... I mean, I would say, do you think there's any way that you can legislate to prohibit that? But it just seems like that, you know, it kind of gets back in the same trap i i, I just, I just I, i'm it feels like that's almost the brick wall of the progressive left it's like how do you overcome the supreme money disadvantage 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, I would love to see and look into, I'm not a legal expert, but I would love to see and know if there's any measures that we could take to sort of ban these private corporations from using their platforms in order to, you know, institute political messaging that benefits them. Like it, it seems like an unfair thing. And like, it's not what people pay for. You know, when you, when you paid into Uber, you didn't think you weren't made aware that I was going to be, you know, supporting a political Super cause PAC, basically. Absolutely. Absolutely against everything. Exactly. Totally against everything that I stand for. And so, no, you know, these are people, a lot of them are like, you know, sort of liberal folks that would, by and large, if they were given the correct information, they would be on our side. And so you don't know that you're voting against these. And it seems like outsized power to hand over to these corporations. And so I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know what can be done exactly, but I would love to see them, them, you know, do something, develop something as far as a consumer protection and put it under the guise of consumer protection because it should be. It sh you should be able to protect yourself. It's our, you know, we're already bombarded by advertising, you know, and false advertising, but for them to be able to use it for political gain, gain seems especially nefarious. Um, so I would love to see something done there to put, to sort of stamp that out. Uh, but also, I, you know, two things that I'll mention is one. You know, we have a history of doing this in Massachusetts with our ballot measures. We we aren't great on our ballot measures. We, we also had a um, patient safe care uh, limits, like uh, you know, patient safe limits, where you know we would we would limit the number of patients that one any one single nurse was able to see in a day, and it would limit like the you know you you'd, they'd have to hospitals would have to enforce like hire more nurses in um, in order to you know make sure that they they could meet that those quotas. So you know, one nurse per every two patients, I think it was in the the emergency room um, and, you know, a little bit more in other in other areas. Uh, and so and there were studies in California had already done this. There were tons of studies, ton, tons of information. I dug through all the studies. It was clear as day. These studies had all shown that, you know, it was a net positive for people. My brother actually was hired from Massachusetts, hired as a nurse. He, you know, he traveled to California and got paid like a quarter of a million dollars as a nurse um, because they, they it was in such high demand. And so my, you know, my, you know, he made literally like two hundred forty thousand dollars a year as a nurse nurse, um, you know, through that. And so that, that, you know, and that benefited not just, you know, the, 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 you know, the state, but also, you know, my family in that way and, and, and helps him and his kids and, and everything. And so what, what it does to working class people. And so we have a history in Massachusetts of, of failing on these ballot benches. And I think that part of that reason is that Massachusetts happened to be like a sort of a, I think it's a sort of a false blue state. You know, we get, we get a lot of like faux progressivism out of Massachusetts and we all, we almost always elect Republican governors. Like you can thank us for Mitt Romney, you know, like you're welcome guys. You're welcome. You know, so you're welcome for Obamacare, which was just Romney care in Massachusetts. You're welcome guys. You know, like this is what we produce here um, is these really corporatist uh, figures in Massachusetts. And I think that the electorate is Ed Markey's all right. Ed Mark is pretty solid. You know, Ed Mark is okay. Um, and he, he's not bad. He's definitely not bad. And, uh, but we, you know, we elect these Republican governors. I think that there's a, you know, there's a mix of sort of the, people are still sort of center, a lot of centrism in, in Massachusetts. Um, and I just want to give a shout out, by the way, to the, the ranked choice voting activists. Like I, I'm in activist spaces here in Massachusetts and there is no louder voice. Any activist space you go to, they find a way. If you're doing an R Revolution meeting, a, you know, People for Bernie, a whatever, you know, your Medicare for all, wherever, whatever meeting you're doing, they come in there and they're there and they're one of the loudest groups um, advocating. And so it was really hurt. It hurt to see how much work those those folks put in and to not accomplish what they accomplished. And I, I just know that that, uh, you know, they were hurt significantly by COVID. So just want to shout them out for all the, the amazing work that they did. Yeah, yeah definitely. That they weren't able to get that through. Do you know if there's any chance of it uh, like getting voted on again or is it like a double jeopardy thing? Can you not vote on the same thing twice? No, I, those folks, they're fighting for it to go back on the okay. ballot again. So they're, they are going to try to put it back on the ballot again. Um, you know, we, we were able to pass like a, a commission to get rid of money, money in politics. We passed that through a ballot measure. We've are, we've are, we passed can't, you know, legalize recreational weed through, yeah. through ballot measure. So we have had some success with ballot measures in, in the state. I just think that we're really susceptible to, uh, you know, the propaganda, the messaging from, you know, all you have to do is pour in enough money and they will flood the radios, TV, you know, all the airwaves 
with uh, Facebook ads. They're really good at, you know, at, at that, that um, you know, messaging here in the state. And so uh, it, there's challenges that we face still because to have true democracy, you don't, you don't just need the, the, you know, the democratic structure put in place. You also need an, a well-informed electorate. You know, you can't have a, Noam Chomsky says, Noam Chomsky says you can't have a functioning democracy without an, an, a well-informed electorate. So that's a critical part of a democracy. People just aren't getting the information, the correct information. Uh, you know, I, I had people in my life that were calling me confused. What, how do I vote? What is this, you know, day of, um, you know, how, how am I supposed to vote on this? What does this mean? Which one's the better one? You know, so folks just didn't get the information that they need, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, anyway, not uh, to derail the conversation, we can get back to that AOC piece that you had. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, not a whole lot to discuss. We don't have to go over it in depth. But uh, you, we were talking a little bit about Corey Bush, who's, uh, in my opinion, the most exciting uh, new freshman in Colorado. Totally agree. Uh, not just because she's uh, from our state of Missouri, where, of course, Zach and I are based out of, but also just because she's, um, you know, just such an incredibly, uh, from the working class, like we mentioned, probably the most working class member of Congress, uh, you know, and I, I, someone who is totally uh, the, the Democratic Party, it pisses me off so much how they um, try to blame their losses on BLM and on the defund the police uh, movement, the movement for black lives. Cori Bush, of course, is of that movement. You know, she's been on the streets even after being elected. She continued uh, to be a part of the protest movement in St. Louis. So I'm just so happy that she won that race. I think it's such an amazing model of progress, even in a place like um, St. Louis, which, of course, isn't, you know, the most liberal city of all time. It, it of course, uh, is not, you know, San Francisco or whatever, but she still won and she beat a, uh, you know, an incumbent. So uh, it did kind of rub me the wrong way in this in this piece um, from AOC where uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say she took credit for it. But th there's this paragraph where she says, um, I've been unseating Democrats for two years. And, and, and she kind of and then she goes on to talk about that's how we elected Ayanna Presley. That's how we elected Jamal Bowman and Cory, and she throws Cory Bush in there. But as we mentioned, as you mentioned, uh, she didn't actually endorse Cory Bush. Uh, did you read this interview with AOC? And did you have any opinions on it? Yeah, I read through a good chunk of it. I haven't seen or read through the full interview, but I, but I, I, I read through a bunch of that New York Times piece there. Um, and I, you know, I came across that part and had the same gut reaction <laughs> of what? Like, how dare you? How dare you? After you, you sat there and you stood, stayed out of that race, which was a, I mean, if folks need to be reminded, the Cory Bush race was so you know, it was such a close race. They actually, it was one of the few times that the decision desk has made an incorrect call yeah. and had to retract right. their call. They actually called the election for Lacey Clay Jr. because the early vote was so overwhelmingly for Lacey Clay Jr. And it wasn't until that day of vote came in for Cori Bush. And it was so overwhelmingly. It was like 80-20 for the early vote for, yeah. for uh, Lacey Clay. And then 80-20 swing back for the day of vote. Um, and that's a lot to do with that grassroots activism, that on the ground activism that she was able to do that really pulled her over the line. And it really was like, she did that all on her own. She did not have the support of any, you know, even the progressive, the so-called like progressive establishment behind her. Bernie Sanders, I think did come in and endorse her, but yeah. AOC stayed out of it. And, yeah. and AOC is such an important, I mean, they were in that movie together, the knock down the house. Yeah, knock down the house. house. Yeah. And so that was such a, you know, such an important race, such a crucial race. And to see AOC sit that out and then to come back here and say, you know, I, you know, I, I work to unseat, uh, you know, these, these Democrats and, you know, and, and put challenges against them. And then to, you know, say her name is just so. Uh, it's a slimy politician move. Yeah. Like was, yeah. You can't call it anything else. Like that was a, that was a straight from the swamp move. That was a, a, my name is associated with the progressive movement. So I can take credit for anything that goes down. Uh, you know, it, it, and, and it's something that I, I personally just, I fuck it. It rubs me the wrong way. Right. Because it's like, you are not the movement, whoever you are, if you are a politician, you are a servant of the people, right? Gavin, me, you, uh, you know, at, at any level, nobody is the movement, right? This is a movement of working class people. And if you don't understand that, then you're really, you're just here for the wrong reason. Right. And, and, and that, you know, it was kind of the same thing, like when, you know, Howie Hawkins called it my green new deal. I was like, you know, no, this is the people's Green yeah. New Deal. This is the people's revolution. And that was one of the things that I thought that Bernie Sanders really anchored his or his uh, whole campaign in that was really smart. Not me, us. Not me, like, yeah. that's the movement that we have to have, especially as we move now to expand the left and, and, and uh, you know, bring in people who were, you know, not on board with Biden or Obama or Clinton or anybody else of that matter. So it is, this is the kind of shit that really rubs me the wrong way. And it, it's the kind of thing that makes me sus about uh, AOC and what she's going to do in the next two years. Obviously, she'll be one of the best 
uh, Congress people that we have. But I just I don't know. I think it's one of those things where she might be moving a little bit too much into the like I'm a career politician mindset. I mean, to be fair, she was she was defending the you know Cory Bush and Jamal Bowman over all these uh, you know corporate Democrats who are trying to blame their losses on Cory Bush and Jamal. True. Bowman. Yeah. No. 100. percent I mean, I think her ethos in this interview was spot on for the most part. But I, I just think that there were that one part did uh, you know get a little bit weird when obviously she wasn't actually there when it mattered for Corey Bush who won regardless. So, I mean, luckily it didn't matter, but, uh, but yeah. Um, like Bernie Sanders goes on TV and he's like, this Ed Markey win is a great win for our revolution. Like, you know what I mean? He wouldn't do that because he didn't endorse that Mark. I don't know. I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that, that it is significant. It's like, you know, it, it, it matters. And it's, it's, it's a thing that if you're paying enough attention to politics, it's and you're on the left, like it's, it's, it's annoying. It's frustrating as, as, as hell, because it's just like, you know, we know, and it feels gaslight. It feels like gaslighting, you know, it's like, are you gaslighting us AOC? You know, like you should know this feeling and like to say, to act like you, you know, and to take credit for something that you really should be crediting the people for. And like you said, Zach, like that is an important thing. Like, you know, none of us are the movement. Uh, I will correct you, of course. Nina Turner is the movement. No teasing, um, you know, but she is that, you know, but but seriously, though, no one no one person is the movement and that and, that, and, and that's absolutely correct. And to not recognize that, acknowledge that, especially in a moment like that, when it's like, you know, th that was totally on that was a, that was the people that did that and so uh especially when you look at you know just the money that came in for Lacey clay versus you know from 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 corporate backing and so yeah i think that the whole that, that dynasty was, of his family name working in tangent with him i mean there was just so much you know working against cory bush which is why it's so astonishing and it's one of those things that i mean it, it really is probably the brightest moment of this entire election cycle for me as a, a progressive to see like this is a working class woman who overcame illness during the uh cycle every obstacle that you could possibly throw at someone and you know and, and on top of that i guess just for a personal reason i mean like she's i i, I just I, I don't know she's just a uh, she's she, she's so authentic and I think that we need more authentic working class voices on the, on the Capitol Hill because they know the urgency of the situations that we're in. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I, I agree that like Cory Bush to me seems like a unique voice. I'm really going to be paying very close attention to Cory Bush and her trajectory through Congress because I want to see if my if my theory holds correct or if there are people because I, I honestly think that she could be the next sort of Bernie Sanders type to actually stick to her principles because she's so rooted in that. And she feels like she like that is in every bone of her body. When you actually look at AOC and sort of where she came from, you know, like there was more of sort of a political establishment connection there happening like she her, you know i think she's dating somebody who was collect connected to the you know the political establishment sort of it, you know running campaigns things like that you know cory bush is rooted in her entirely in activism you black know? lives matter activism in ferguson yeah absolutely so it's like that's what she was born out of and i just i i don't see her ever losing sight of that and losing touch with that and so i really do i feel like she i hope that she will be sort of the you know the the guiding force on the squad moving forward i think that it'll take her a few you know a little while to sort of get up to speed and to feel comfortable to feel comfortable to gain her confidence but then once she does i really do hope that she's sort of the voice of the left in in congress because i think that she's the most clear-eyed about it um and because she's really felt the pain and she's you know she had a recent interview with ali Velshi on cnn and she just when she talks about the pain that she felt and you know she's been food insecure and how she's not known where her not just her net you know her next meal is coming from but you know the mail a week from now and for her kids um and when somebody's felt that that level of pain i just think that it's really hard to lose that uh and so yeah i'll be watching her she's sort of my litmus test really of like can a democrat you know can can a progressive hold on to their principles through this machine and i really pay I'll, i think we should all pay close attention to cory bush and 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 how she you know moves through congress uh you know for the next few years yeah 100 percent. i also was a huge fan of that uh, appearance that you just mentioned um where she where she yeah talked about the food insecurity the fact that you know even if you go to a food pantry uh, you know, you, you might only be able to go once a month and then they won't let you back in or you'll go to a food pantry, but you get food that's expired. Like yeah. uh, things are things are really bad out there. And and she does understand that, which is um, just something that so many of our elected officials do not understand. Like they just don't. So uh, yeah. I think it's so important that she's she's there. And you mentioned uh, Nina Turner, too. And um, unless anyone had anything else to say on the current topic, I think that's a, a good segment into uh, our next topic. 
uh, and, and, and like I said, Kamali, feel free to uh, dip whenever you need to. No, I um, do long streams just like y'all. I, I like the sort of Joe Rogan ish, not that I, you know, <laughs> not, I should use that as a reference on the left, but like, I like the Joe Rogan yeah. style, yeah. like just like free form, chill Hell for yeah. a little while, Shit you know, talking. For a while. exactly. Like it's a little, you know, less pressure. It just flows a yeah. little bit nicer for me. So I'm totally, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's our style too. We're, we're like yeah. the opposite of edited or scripted here at all. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, um, I, I guess a good way to start this um, this next segment a little bit, uh, where Nina Turner recently appeared on Andrew Yang's podcast, and and we thought this would be a good uh, thing to talk about or react to tonight because uh, something that's kind of been a long running, uh, I wouldn't say like feud or anything, but um, a little bit of a disagreement that Zach and I have always had on the on the podcast, which we've always kind of gone back and forth a little bit on, is just uh, our opinions on the man himself, Andrew Yang, and uh, also a little bit. Uh, to a lesser extent, a disagreement on, you know, the policy itself of universal basic income, how it would be implemented, you know, uh, it's just an interesting conversation that I think there's so many different valid perspectives on, so much nuance to, and uh, I think it's a good uh, discussion to have with anyone. So I just wanted to know your opinion, first off, on Andrew Yang, what you thought of his campaign, what you think of him as a, a presence on the left or in, in the political uh, sphere, uh, and uh, then we'll watch a little bit of the interview and get your reaction to that as well. Yeah. So on Yang, I think that generally speaking, like generally speaking, broadly speaking, I I, I like the general idea of like, you know, anti-establishment, you know, something from outside of the the bounds of, of normalcy in the establishment. Uh, I like to see those kind of candidates running uh, Tulsi Gabbard and Andrew Yang, uh, Bernie Sanders, even if I don't agree with all of, you know, say Tulsi or Andrew Yang's policies, not even Bernie's, you know, I totally agree with. Um, so I do like to see, I think that he was a good voice to have there on the debate stages. I thought that he had some, you know, it, it, what he, his messaging on, you know, on the debate stage, I thought was solid. And he was able to get in some good points. And I think that it's it's good to have those voices counteracting the, you know, 50 establishment Repub uh, Republicans, Freudian slip, you see, um, uh, you know, establishment Democrats that they had up there, uh, the Michael Bennett's, you know, uh, uh, you know, shit and all over like Medicare for all. And, uh, and, yeah, yeah. And so like, it was John a good counter. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, like the Hickenlooper, Kate, what was it Hickenlooper and Kasich that we're going to try to run like on like, oh. a, uh, yeah, oh, just like. Her uh, images, your cursed things get away from <laughs> uh, the unity ticket you know um you'll notice that the, that the democrats are always more willing to unify with republicans than they are with progressives you know like that's not unity to them the real unity ticket was howie hawkins and the socialist angela walker who's like a truck driver or something yeah I, I, yeah so uh you know but so on yang I, you know, generally speaking, you know, I, I like that about, you know, I like that about him. As far as his policy goes, I think that he's just like a, you know, like a like undercover libertarian sort of. And Dude, like, I, I, um, I, I resonate with that diagnosis a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, like, I think that his policy for UBI. I did not agree with. I agree with the concept. I I believe it that at this stage, you know, I do think like a UBI could be a a you know, you get people to the mo you get money to the people, get it directly. We saw what happened with the the stimulus through the CARES Act. Like if you look at the um the federal pandemic unemployment compensation and, and the 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 graph of people's uh, savings, like low income working class people, their savings like went up and up when they started to get those the, for the first time in a long time, and the spending remained, and they were they were able to save more. Uh, and then as soon as that 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 stimulus stopped, it just dropped. It just literally fell like off a cliff. And so I I, I could totally get behind an idea like a universal basic income um, as a stopgap measure. You know, folks like Richard Wolf will say like it it can't be the 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 our our end goal because honestly i think that if you if you put a ubi into a capitalist system then all we us humans are now just simply to the capitalists we have now totally been reduced to nothing but consumers you know like we are we are their 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 you know their labor force and we are just consumers and all that they will need from us is consumption and so i don't you know i think that that puts us in a place if we really just have a ubi under a capitalist system i think it takes us to a place where we lose all sense of sort of self-worth and meaning and purpose. We need, you know, human beings 
you know, crave, uh, uh, you know, purpose. We, we search for meaning and purpose. Uh, you, you put somebody out of work. Like I'm, I've been unemployed for a year. I didn't just sit on my ass and do nothing. You know, I started a podcast, you know, I started a podcast. I started a show. I, you, you feel an urge, you feel worthless almost when you're not working every day. You feel is even as a leftist, even as a socialist, it's been internalized so much that you feel these feelings, these creeping feelings of, of inadequacy, inadequacy and, and worthlessness. And so I, I do believe that human beings do need that purpose and that work for now can provide that sense of purpose. Um, and so I, 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 but the problem is if you create a you know, UBI system, it's just like all that they're going to do with no rent controls or anything like that, you put that in place and then the landlords are just going to find a way to jack up rents over the next few years. And then all of a sudden rents everywhere will be a thousand dollars a month, you know, higher every month and all that will get soaked up by, by landlords. So in with specifically with Andrew Yang's UBI policy, it was a, it was a, 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 a swap. You had to exchange. It was an exchange of a policy. Yeah. It wasn't just a policy sitting on top of all of our existing social services. It was a UBI that said, if you take this UBI, um, you have to give up some of your your existing social services like SNAP benefits and and and, and uh, you know uh, other like um, you know for 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 disabled people and social security uh, benefits. So you would have to give up those. And what what that does, all that does is if you're a a person that is marginalized person right now, you're a disabled person right now. You're getting some sort of you know um, uh, you know monthly stipend and your cash poor. You need cash. Absolutely. You know, in 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 and all of a sudden, you know, you have to you have to exchange. That out. That means that if it's it, you know you may you might give up eight hundred dollars in exchange for the one thousand. You know you were getting eight hundred dollars a month from social services. You exchange that out for the one thousand. You've only got a net gain of two hundred dollars. You know for the for the for the most. Or you trade sixteen hundred dollars for a thousand. Potentially, you know, I've been borrowing a term from Zizek to describe it as a chocolate laxative, which I think works pretty well. <laughs> um, I, just to kind of hover on that point and talk about something that you know, Gavin and I have found is a more of a common agreement with the UBI, because I certainly came from more of your position on that argument. I, at first, I, you know, I wrote this big piece back in like October or September of last year, that was about like 2020 is the year of the outsider candidate kind of talking about Yang, Tulsi, Gravel, you know, it was kind of in the early stages of the Democratic primary. And I was compelled and interested in Andrew Yang when he was still talking about Medicare for all and, you know, a Green New Deal and all those kinds of things, but before it fell to the bait and switch. But what I do, uh, you know, uh, really find myself sympathetic to uh, with the UBI argument and uh, something that I think you kind of touched on there and your, uh, you know, kind of analysis of it is the fact that, you know, something that I found that I do believe, and I think this is something that Gavin uh, and I have found we share in a, our, you know, worldview is that we think that over time we need to start decoupling uh, labor from uh, financial stability and from income, right? Just because, you know, I don't want to sell myself in this capitalist system doesn't mean that I shouldn't have, you know, access to basic things like food and shelter and healthcare. Um, I'm wondering if you think that on, on top of workplace democracy, on top of universal nationalized healthcare, on top of, you know, these robust social um, systems that I think everybody on this show is, you know, kind of in agreement are absolutely ne necessary. How do you think we can implement UBI to kind of uplift the burden of, you know, relying on a nine to five kind of horseshit job and being able to devote yourself like this podcast or uh, something that actually fulfills you instead yeah. of, you know, as a ticket terror at the AMC, just because we have to work for, you know, a cause for some reason. Yeah, because just to piggyback off that real quick, too, before you answer, but uh, like you mentioned that after you lost your job, you started this podcast. Well, to me, that is your job. Like, that is work, too. And uh, like, to me, at least, doing this podcast is way more fulfilling than any fucking job that I would ever want to do that could be working for someone, for some corporation, and getting paid some slave wage. So in my mind, I almost, I almost feel that the whole, like, you need a job to be fulfilled is kind of capitalist propaganda. And that actually the true fulfillment comes from doing this kind of work, which isn't necessarily profitable, but uh, that a government income could definitely sustain and, you know, kind of subsidize. So that's where my, you know, difference of opinion on that is. I, I don't feel fulfilled at all going to a job that crushes me and, you know, takes my energy and, uh, you know, prevents me from putting time energy into what I really want to do, which is stuff like this. So that's just where I come at it. No, absolutely. And I, 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 I totally agree with that, really. And there's a great piece by um, John Maynard Keynes, the one of the fathers of, yeah. of you know, an entire segment. Of 
Yeah, the 15 hour work week, you know, he envisioned what 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 work would be like 100 years from, you know, he wrote it in 1930, it would have been 2030. And he imagined that, you know, we would by then through all the technological advancements, we would every time we made a technological advancement, we would we would reward ourselves by by, okay, we can we can produce twice as much stuff in half the time. All right, well, we'll work half as much not we'll fire half of the people and leave them destitute and still, you know, you know, produce the same amount, um, which is how capitalism has actually enacted technological advancements. And so I, 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 I do, I totally agree that I think that, you know, this idea of like, you know, self-discovery and self, you know, like uh, fulfillment and being able to self, you know, self-discovery and, and that we should have time for that. I, I, I totally agree that we need to be moving in the direction of less, you know, less hours worked every week. I would love to see a, you know, I would love to see a 15 hour work week. And I think that it is possible in this system if we didn't have a capitalist structure where whenever the money came in, we had a handful of people that got to make all the decisions, all the profits of all of our labor, you know, even though profits are produced in labor itself, you know, and we've covered it on our show with Richard Wolf has has talked about this time, you know, you know, time and time again, but how the profits in a business in a capitalist business are produced during the, you know, the, by the workers through their labor, you know, they, they, they add their labor, um, you know, in their, to the, 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 you know, the, 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 uh, raw materials they add in their labor and that's what creates the, the value in something profit, yeah. uh, exactly not markets markets don't create the profits the, the the workers create the profits and if we didn't have a system where all those where where workers you know where those profits were then able to be like you know sucked up by a few people a handful of people that have all the decision making power over the few um then we wouldn't do things like would all the amazon workers get together and decide democratically that they would like to give billions of dollars not just to jeff bezos but to the white of Jeff Bezos to make her the richest woman on the planet just because she divorced their, you know, the, the, their boss. Like if you, if workers democratically got together, no chance in hell, you tell me that they're, they're going to be, you know, peeing in bottles, uh, you know, because they can't, they, they get no breaks um, it, while the, you know, billions are being, you know, absorbed by the, the wife of their boss that, that for the labor that they produced, um, no chance in hell. And so I do think that we could have a system where we, you know, we're, we're right now, you know, we can produce enough and it's, it's already shown in other countries have proven that, you know, a shorter work week actually provides, creates more productive workers. If we have shorter work weeks, then you come in, you say, I got less time to get my work done. You know what? I'm not going to sit there on Facebook and, you know, kicking it with all, you know, the, like my coworkers, I'm just going to get my work done and get the hell out of here. And so I do want us to move in a direction of moving away from having to do what is, you know, meaningless grunt work, things that don't fulfill us. I do not want to see any human being suffer under that. I think that the, the way that we get to that is like, we have to get to a point where one, we have actual democratic control over our institutions because by and large, I think that people agree on this. If you give people this information, you say, hey, would you like to keep working 40 hours a week to produce way more than what we actually need to produce to, to survive? Because if you're not making just a handful of people rich, we can actually spread that wealth out amongst yeah. everyone. And this gets to the second half of my Yang critique, which I, which I think you're getting right into there. We have the ability to produce all of this stuff. And so one of the things that I think everybody, most people's first big exposure came to Andrew Yang when he went on the Joe Rogan podcast, right? And he was laying out this big thing about how he's been riding around with truck drivers and automation. And, you know, we're already in the third inning and all the shit that he was saying on all of his stump speeches all the over time and stirring up this big, you know, uh, kind of a kerfuffle about uh, automation, right? And, you know, we could debate whether how accurate he was with, you know, his projections and all that. I think the crux of what he was getting at is a real issue. The fact that we're about to automate away all of our jobs, truck driving is about to go away. It's a major ish, uh, issue, right? Uh, however, and I, I think the thing that uh, irritates me a lot about Andrew Yang is how prescient his diagnosis is and how just completely flawed I find his uh, solution or not flawed, but just in, in, inadequate, right? So he's about to be like, well, I know that a thousand bucks a month won't solve this, but you should vote for me because it's a start. And I think that what it really shows is that we need to change the capitalist system in a way that we give people enough control so that when we do have all of our needs met, we're able to produce enough output as a nation uh, to meet everybody's needs using automation uh, that we're not in still, you know, essentially leaving everybody else out to dry saying, oh, sorry, you weren't part of the ownership class. Now you're part of the, you know, lower caste because you're not in the managerial class or the ownership class. And now the working class is done by machines. So it seems like if we don't solve that problem, um, and get, you know, like you've talked about, obviously, so much on your channel with workplace democracy. Uh, I, I don't think that we ever get to reap the benefit of what automation should really be, which is a gift to people so that it's a free freeing themselves from that work, 
uh, wage slavery that we've been talking about on the show. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I worked, my job before this was a software engineer. You know, I built, I created those automating systems. You know, I was one of those people and I'll tell you, like I was making, you know, I was making six figures doing that, but I also faced discrimination in the workplace. It's a capitalist institution. You know, they, they, they have this like in, in, in Silicon Valley and in the Silicon Valley sort of, uh, you know, ethos is like all this, like, you know, superficially, you know, like social justice, you know, diversity. Um, but it's, what they're looking for is like to diversify the ruling class, essentially, you know, that's what their real interest is. And as soon as you talk, start talking about like bread and butter, working class issues, workplace democracy, you quickly find or like the the existing like, uh, you know, systemic racism or sexism in, uh, you know, in the industry, then you quickly find yourself without a job, which I did multiple times. And then, you know, it was it, it, I got to a point where it was like, I can't do this because I feel so gross inside doing this work. I literally have built software that then, you know, for, in, you know, it was educational software, you know, it was, it was used by schools um, and for their admissions process. And they literally, um, I'll pro you know, I got to be careful. I might get sued for this, you know, whatever. I don't give a damn, you know, you can't get blood from a turnip. So sue me all you want. I ain't got shit. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I worked, you know, it, for this admissions, you know, it, it, it was like a, you know, a chat bot that you could chat through and, and, it, and it, it helped you, guided you through the admissions process for college. And on the website, you know, the, 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 we had quotes from a, one of the administrators at, you know, at, at, at uh, Georgia State University where uh, Ben Burgess is a teacher um, uh, and, there's a quote from one of them saying, uh, you know, if, if, if we didn't have this tool, we would have had to hire 20 more people um, to do this work. And my immediate thought, like I got sick to my stomach when I read that. I was like, so you mean to tell me that there are 20 more jobs that I could have you know, created by just not doing the work that I was doing, you know, could have left 20 more jobs. That's 20 more people employed. That's 20 families with an, you know, an income in the family. And that matters. That's a community that think of the impact to the community that that has. So I do believe, I do believe that we are, you know, automating jobs away. That is a very real problem. It's a serious problem. I mean, uh, you know, truck driving is the number one, uh, uh, you know, job is in the, for, in yeah, the for males in the heartland, for sure. Yeah, it's, it, uh, you know, and so, um, you know, and we, we have, uh, you know, the, 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 the drive, you know, automated driving, you know, coming on the horizon and it absolutely is going to wipe some of these people out. It, but the reality is, as long as we exist within a capitalist system, that's the reason why it's wiping people's jobs out, right? What we could do is if, you know, when we get the automated drivers, we could say, listen, you drivers, you're the literal reason. The drivers are the reason why they can automate the software. Let me tell you, like as somebody that builds automated software, the, an AI, I worked with AI, the way that it works is it gathers data from existing people. You know, it, people have to do the work. They have to, they have to do the work over and over again so that we can collect enough data to try to automate the process away. But we don't reward those people who did all that work, who did all that labor, that we're basing our, our technology off of, those people should benefit. If we if your labor then cre made it so that now we can automate this process away, well, every truck driver should get to transition out and just, you know, get that universal basic income. We've automated your industry away. Thank you for your service. Retire. Enjoy life. You did all the work that you needed to do. You've accomplished that. You get to retire out. And, or what we do is, you know, we, we, we then split it up and we say, okay, th that that's work is automated away. We're going to take those people. We're going to redistribute them throughout the system or whatever. And everybody's going to gonna get a job, but they're just going to work less time, you know, because we're going to have more workers. So instead of, you know, everybody just works half the time that they're going to work, but get paid the same amount. And you'll never do that under a capitalist system because you have a handful of people, the, the board of directors, the employer making the decisions over for the masses of people. It's usually 10 to 20 people on a board of directors in these companies, these massive corporations that have hundreds or tens of thousands of employees like in Amazon have a board of directors of, in, 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 this, in the major shareholders is a handful, a, you know, a, a few dozen people making decisions for the masses and they will never decide to do things that benefit. Not only will they never decide, they're legally barred from doing so. If you look back and this is a, you know, an old case, obviously, but Ford v. Dodge Brothers, right? Everybody's familiar with Ford Motors and Do uh, Dodge Motors, right? Uh, what actually started the Dodge Brothers founded Dodge Motors after a lawsuit uh, against Henry Ford. Henry Ford had uh, the Model T Ford and uh, Ford Auto and it became the most, it, basically he was the Jeff Bezos of his time, right? He was the guy that was making all of the money and what he was like, holy shit, we've made so much of this money. Let's give it back to the workers. Uh, now, you know, my family's made more money than we could ever spend all of our stock. Everybody's rich beyond their wildest dreams. They were the only automobile manufacturer. It was, a, I mean, a hot market, right? 
And he was like, let's give a lot more money back to the workers. Now we know what everything that we exceed past this kind of threshold of profit that we feel is necessary for us to continue doing business. Right. He literally got taken to court by the Dodge brothers who were shareholders in his company, sued him because and, and they argued that it was the obligation in the law that the um, you know the uh, this the this they had to work in the best interest not of the workers um but of the shareholders and that law or not that law but that court case obviously went in the favor of the Dodge brothers and the rest is history right yeah. um so but anyway i just not only are they unwilling to which they have certainly are but they're literally legally barred from it in this country yeah they have a literal fiduciary responsibility in order to you know maximize profits that is their fiduciary responsibility they will literally they 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 will they can and will be fired from their jobs if they do not do so and so if even if they didn't they would simply get rid of them and replace them with somebody else who would exploit workers and make sure in order to maximize those profits. So the system is literally set up so that you have to, um, you know, maximize profits for those shareholders. You're 100% correct. Um, and so, yeah, it's not just, you know, it's in, in the system. We always talk about, you know, the system is set up. The system is capitalism and capitalism is defined. The thing that makes capitalism unique is the employer employee relationship. That's the thing that if, when you talk about a definition for something, we, we create definitions of things so that they can help us to uh, differentiate between other things, right? We call a chair a chair and a table a table because we know that they're both pieces of furniture. They both have four legs and a, and a, you know, and a flat surface, but we call one this and one that because we want to differentiate when we discuss with each other. Same thing. We know, you know, a dog is a dog, but we, we differentiate different breeds of dog. We know this is a dog. This is a cat. We do that so that we can categorize things and we do, we, we define them by what's unique about them. Well, what's unique about the capitalist system is not as some people like to say markets, uh, you know, uh, you know, markets are, are, are what are, what are unique and, uh, and, and decentralized planning. They say that that's unique to capitalism, but in fact, markets existed in, in every system, every economic system that we know of markets existed in feudalism. People took, there were merchants, they took their wares to market. Um, markets existed under slavery. There was a slave market. There was also markets for everything that the slaves produced, right? The cotton, the tobacco, there were markets for those things as well. So markets are not what's unique to capitalism what are, what is what's unique to capitalism. It's the employee employee relationship in feudalism we had the the lord and the serf in in slavery we had slave and um, master and slave and in the, in under capitalism we have employer employee and that's the fundamental change that we need to make we need there's there's an inherent tension in that in that employer employee relationship the employer is always constantly trying to extract as much as they can from the em the employer is trying to extract as much as they can from the employee and the employee is fighting to extract as much as they can from the employer through like benefits uh, and things of that nature. And so higher wages benefits. And so let's just get rid of that, that tension and that constant struggle because we've seen what the outcome of that struggle is, is the employer class always wins because they have all the money. And so we have to get rid of that, 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 that employer employee relationship by replacing that with, you know, make every employee an employer as well, you know, combine those two, um, you know, build a democratic workplace and get rid of that inherent tension. Uh, and yeah. so that's why we have advocate so strongly for that. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and by the way, I'm a huge advocate for the same stuff. And, and part of the uh, kind of frustrating thing I always feel about the UBI conversation is that uh, like I advocate for it in addition to all of those things. And I, and I feel like it always gets taken as if it's going to be at the expense of anything else. When in my mind, it's kind of the first step towards uh, what we would look at as kind of a utopia where people don't have to work as much. And it, it would change the way people start thinking about uh, government and what they can receive as far as benefits goes. And also just the acknowledgement that, you know, we talk about living under this capitalist system. I'm no capitalist, I'm a socialist, but uh, we have to acknowledge that we do live in a capitalist system. And as much as the three of us would like to change that, it's, uh, you know, it is a capitalist system. So I think uh, for people to live with dignity in that system in case they lose their job, uh, which they probably hate anyway, and probably is, you know, sucking all their creative energy out of them. If they lose that job, they have, you know, a little bit of money so that they can uh, eat so that they can pay their rent. You know, I think that food is a human right. I think that housing is a human right. But I don't think that those things uh, can be guaranteed as rights unless income is also guaranteed as a right. So I just think it needs to be included in the conversation that um, income, as, lo as long as we are in a capitalist system, which unfortunately, newsflash, we are, uh, income has to be a right or else uh, there is no dignity for people that are suffering, for people that are out of work, for people uh, that are, you know, on the shit end of the system, which is, as we've said, you know, built to benefit the top and uh, not the bottom. So uh, th that's my take on UBI. And again, I, I'm no capitalist. I, and I and I totally agree, too. I have the I have the um, 
you know, the fear that a UBI it continues the materialization, the commodification of everything in our society from food to, you know, nature to everything. So I have those fears too. I guess it's more just born from an acknowledgement of the reality that we're in and that maybe it could be, um, you know, maybe one of the most and easiest best ways to get help to people that desperately need it. That's my that's my take on UBI, but I 100% agree with all of your criticisms of Andrew Yang. And as far as using UBI as a bait and switch for um, you know your other benefits for your healthcare, that's horseshit. Uh, and I think that is a complete misappropriation of the of the policy that uh, I've always, you know, that was basically when I stopped uh, supporting Yang's uh, campaign in any sense was when I realized that that was kind of the, the problem with it. Uh, that being said, I do think the dude has some interesting opinions, some interesting policy ideas. And uh, I have to give him credit too for um, endorsing a lot of, you know, down ballot candidates that even people like Bernie did. And so I, I think, yeah, I, I think he's definitely, um, you know, there's a far, a big distinction between like someone like Yang and, and, you know, someone like, uh, you know, Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or whatever. He's definitely not, uh, you know, maybe part of someone that I would uh, campaign for as president. But if it came down to someone like him versus Donald Trump, I would happily vote for him over like a Donald Trump. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Whereas absolutely. I couldn't vote myself to uh, vote for a Joe Biden or a Kamala Harris or a Michael Bloomberg. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. So that I, I would have voted for Yang. I did not vote for yeah. Joe Biden. I would have voted for Andrew Yang, but I did not vote for Joe Biden because I do believe, and I and I and I think that we could have made a fight against. Andrew Yang, because I don't think that it's necessarily nefarious with Andrew Yang. I think that he's yeah. just your typical Silicon, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, bro. And and my exposure to Andrew Yang is actually a little bit different because it's one of those weird things. Uh, Venture for America. So uh, just a little bit about my background, my like whole, uh, you know, e economic, dis you know, coming around as a socialist. I, I was actually in business school in college, you know, uh, and I was, uh, you know, if deeply involved in this organization that was sort of like all, uh, how we're going to use capitalism to innovate ourselves out of all these like kind of just horrible things that are going on in our society. And, you know, through, you know, just uh, my evolution, I, you know, that was all sort of for the birds. But one of the big things that everybody was so obsessed with when I was involved in the program was Venture for America, which for people who aren't familiar is one of the, this is basically the organization that Andrew Yang founded. And I think that's what makes me a little bit more suspicious of Andrew Yang. I think uh, uh, it, just reflecting on all of the people who were in, in their political perspectives and how they, they viewed changing the world through market innovation and bringing startups to places like Austin, Texas and Detroit, which is in my view, just going to displace a lot of the, you know, working class and, uh, you know, gentrify those cities and push out a lot of people. So just bringing, uh, you know, PMC economic, uh, opportunity to an area isn't, you know, certainly isn't going to solve any, uh, issue. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, your guys are certainly correct in the fact that he would be miles better than somebody like a uh, Joe Biden, because I think that at least he hasn't been weathered by this like whole kind of idea of what Washington has to be. And, you know, he doesn't seem as limited and confined in, you know, policy visions and things like that. He would at least seem open to, you know, making a change and not narrowly like, Oh no, we can't do that. That's ridiculous. That's pie in the sky. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, and, you know, I just want to make that clear, too, because I know Yang Yang, whenever you talk about Andrew Yang, like they find their way to those comments. Oh, and they I, 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 I've so, taken my fair share from the Yang Gang. Calm down, <laughs> Yang Gang. Calm down. You know, we're not 100 percent against <laughs> Yang or anything like that. You know, we give him a chance. Um, but he's definitely, you know, like I so I agree with Gavin. I, you know, I would support him over at Joe Biden. I think that, you know, I totally agree with what you said there. And in fact, you know, a little bit more background on me. I'm also, you know, of that sort of I was, you know, five years ago, I called my I consider myself a centrist. I was totally like I, I bought the neoliberal meritocratic, you know, BS. I was I, you know, I wasn't in business school. I was an engineer, but I I, I, I entered a business launch competition at my, at, you know, at my university, won the business launch competition and launched, you know, launched a capitalist, you know, business that still stands to this day. I'm, I'm technically the CEO of this, you know, this capitalist, uh, you know, it's educational software. It's like online note taking and study platform. You take notes, click a button, instantly turn your, your notes into decks of flashcards. And then it has like a whole automated, um, you know, uh, uh, space repetition uh, some, learning system. That's some true innovation of right there. <laughs> exactly. You know, so I, I was, I was in there. I mean, we, we won it through like a shark tank style competition, business oh, really? competition. That's yeah. Cool. So like it was, you know, I, I, I was, I went through all of the motions. I in fact could have been the next Mark Cuban, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I incorporated my business through, uh, you know, one of the largest like corporate lawyers, um, Foley Hogue in Massachusetts. They're one of the, the biggest, uh, corporate lawyers and they, 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 they made us set up, a, 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 a you know, like a, a, a an S corp inside of Delaware 
everywhere. You know, they, they encouraged us. They, they told us when we were there in meetings, two of us out of the three, we had three members of our, of our group. Two of us went to a meeting because the third one couldn't make it. And the guy there, the lawyer there tried to convince us to push the, the third one out. Cause he said, he told us, you want to maintain, you want to keep the, 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 the control over the, over the company. You have to keep as you want to make sure that you have as few people as possible on your board of directors. So he, he tried to tell, he tried to convince two of us to push out the third one. And that was only three of us. And here they're already trying to set up a system where it's like, you know, keep one down and, and, and try to maintain and hold control over this power. And in fact, running a, you know, building a capitalist business, if you do the, enough of those, those programs and you, you, they have like programs like, like, you know, Yang's venture for America. They have other programs. There's a program called Y Combinator where you try to, yeah, yeah know, the incubator. Yeah incubator programs and in those they give you all these statistics about about capitalist businesses and how businesses do they don't say it's capitalist they just say how businesses perform and one of the things that they warn you of as you're going through this is that there's a very high likelihood that when you start a business with your friends that it creates tensions in your friendships and it was like something that we were warned about like that it will create tensions in your friendships and there's a lot of people that go into business together end up uh you know end up in you know with the tension that that splits them apart or whatever and I, I experienced it myself my best friend and I do not speak anymore because of the capitalist business that we created because all of the tension and all of that pressure to perform and i you know i i, I was saying things like i don't care about your your loved ones and like we just need to work we got to work more and they get you in that mindset and they and you they have you believing it yourself that oh i got here because i'm smarter better you know faster stronger than the other i'm an person. innovator i'm a world changer you know like yeah it's that whole chaos monkeys kind of like silicon valley social network kind of vibe out yeah and just to continue that i'm perfectly prepared to stab gavin right in the front as soon as the duffel bags from the <laughs> uh, cash from the kremlin uh come on this will be a one-man live stream but uh... <laughs> no they absolutely they have you in there and they got you in that mindset and and they have you buying that you know drinking that kool-aid and before long you know you're just you're you're, you're, you're following along and you, and you believe it because you think oh well i you know if i succeeded it must mean that it, that, that this is real um and so it, it's 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 uh, when i say this you know a lot of people i i, I get some feedback from right wingers and conservatives that are like oh you just can't succeed and you're just bitter because you don't know how to do anything and you're just dumb and you you know you're, you you know you you know but it's like no 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 listen i made it you know i i started the the, the, the a capitalist business i became the ceo of that you know we launched software that is used all around the world still to this day um you know but i but it, I felt gross. I felt terrible doing what I did and it felt wrong. Um, and so, yeah, I just don't, uh, it, but on the topic of UBI, I just want to say, you know, and like I, 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 I mentioned that I don't think that Andrew Yang was necessarily nefarious. I just think that he misunderstood and, and, and truly believed that that was a better policy, the way that he was structuring it. He thought maybe he was, you know, oh, cutting down on some of the red tape and, 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 yeah. and the bureaucracy of, of, uh, you know, the, the, the government. Um, but I think that what Ilhan Omar is talking about in that clip that you played earlier, I think that that's a different form of UBI. I don't think for a second that Ilhan Omar is going to introduce a bill that says that you have to exchange, you know, UBI for another service. I totally agree with right now, you know, you UBI, I think it's a solid stopgap measure as long as we acknowledge that it's just a stopgap and that we can't it cannot be the end goal because it, yeah. it's gonna make a lot of people comfortable. And I and I and I worry that that comfort might get people to say, all right, well, I guess this capitalist system does work after all, you know, and let's not change the capitalist structure and let's continue to be I mean, for the rest of I our mean, lives. I think, that, I think that's fair enough, but I think you could say the same thing about like, well, if you give people Medicare, then they're not gonna want to fight for other causes. Like, I mean, some people need money, just like some people need Medicare. So I think uh, that aside, I think we should pursue giving people that relief if they if they need it I, I mean I think similarly to any policy it's not a it's not the end-all be-all I don't think in any single policy will uh, you know get us a hundred percent of the way of the way there that's why I always try to include it in a conversation you know it can't be exclusive of the Green New Deal for example because yeah capitalism is destroying our environment we can't just fuel capitalism and ignore the environmental destruction so it, it needs to be a confluence of policies Absolutely. And this connects to that Cori Bush interview that we talked about with Ali Velshi. She she mentioned that and she talked about that. And she said, listen, it's not just about, you know, 
the the fifteen dollar minimum wage because sure you can give people a fifteen dollar minimum wage or whatever um you know but you also have to think about okay well you know even with that like you have other layers to it right where people might because they're they're homeless and they don't have a place to shower you know that they can't they they go into these places and they can't even they can't even shop in certain places because that you know they 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 don't smell good and so they get kicked out of these stores or they don't have you know shoes to wear and so it's like no no shoes no shirt no service kind of kind of thing and so you know you, you know you try to get a job or something like that it's like you, you need you also need to have uh, understand the different layers to it and, and, and acknowledge that it is sort of the intersectionality of poverty yeah. and how those those issues overlap and and recognize that yeah you, you it's not just about giving the basic income but we also have to provide you know housing security for people through you know rent controls tenant unions um you know uh measures like that uh build more public housing you know measures like that as well green new deal policies to try to fight and make sure that we have a planet to live on it doesn't help to have like a, a table and food if you don't have like a house and a roof over your head um and so uh definitely and i think that what ilhan omar is talking about is a ubi sitting on top of it and i would you know the person that she was there being interviewed alongside is is a uh, mayor tubbs he was one of the like yeah. youngest mayors in sacramento and what he's really known for is providing a, a small experimental universal basic income and let's just be clear like they're the the largest universal basic income experiment to ever exist that I know of um, and that I'm familiar with is in America. It's Alaska. Alaska has a universal basic income system. Every resident, if you're a resident of Alaska, through the oil um, companies, you know, they have the, the, they, they pay out dividends every year. They invest that money and that money pays out dividends. And they take that amount and they split it up amongst, they just divide it by how many, you know, you know, adults are, are living in Alaska at the time and they split it up evenly. And sometimes it's it's 5,000, sometimes it's eight or $10,000 a year that they give to people, which is almost about if you think about a 10 or twelve thousand dollars twelve thousand dollars is a thousand dollars a month so mm -hmm. you know that they do have a universal basic income that has existed right here in america um for a very long time and has been successful and so we don't have to go far to look for examples of universal basic incomes that sit on top of all the rest of our social programs um and i think that what ilhan omar is talking about and what we're talking about here is uh you know something yeah. like that and i totally would 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 support that because you know, and I think that the way that we do that and the way that the left should fight for that, by the way, I think that our messaging on the left um, should be social security for all. The yeah. same way that we pushed yeah. for you for Medicare for all, we should just call it social security okay. for all. It's a program that already exists. We just simply lower the age of social security from 65 to zero. Boom, it's done. Everybody gets it. We already have a, 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 a you know an institution that knows how to you know get people checks every single month. Let's just use that same system. And it, I think that the, the 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 messaging will will play well, just like Medicare for all plays well. People are familiar with it. It's a universal program. If you're over a certain age, those programs are wildly popular already. Let's just use social security and and, and provide that to every single person. And yeah, I think that I don't think it'll make people more like complacent with capitalism or whatever, because I think when people have a little bit of extra money in their pocket and they don't have to be working 40 hours a week as a result, then they're going to have more time to organize. They're going to have more time. They're not just going to be, you know, stuck at their job all day. They're not just going to be slaving away their life. Uh, giving people that a little bit of extra padding uh, does give them the time to pursue their um, what they want to do. And a lot of people, what they want to do is pursue activism. They just don't have the time. So I, I just think that there's a lot to be, um, you know, said, and, and obviously the the big problem with UBI is just the the way that it can be implemented uh, versus to help the people versus to you know cut back on those benefits, and I think that just muddies the conversation so much because of that potential. You know, UBI has been uh, prescribed by right wingers and you know far left wingers. It's yeah, everybody from Martin Luther King to Milton Friedman. You know, yeah. so it's really like take your poison of the whole like oh yeah, you're kind of opening yourself up to a criticism from anywhere. And, and I to be honest, I think that it, it uh, honestly it does really depend on you know who are the people who are leaving leading this prescription. That's why I was you know I'm so uh, not worried about a, a a UBI that's coming from somebody like Ilhan Omar, like you said, whereas somebody with a more businessy kind of you know capitalist sympathetic to put it mildly mindset. Uh, of Andrew Yang is somebody where I'm like, especially because he just laid it out. He was like, I want to remove all of our other, you know, social welfare if you have the UBI. And I just thought that set up an, a higher system where they're just going to, oh, see, nobody's even using this anymore. We don't need that. And then it's like, you know, okay, now we're, ready. but anyway, uh, anyway. And it's also very much more difficult for the average person to try to calculate out when they're getting social services from all these diverse set of services, it's very hard to calculate out and compute out how much, what's the value of all of these services. So to try to, ex for, to ask the average person to go and exchange, you know, to decide whether or not they want to make that exchange, I think it's totally unfair. And, and I 
100% agree with you, Gavin, that, you know what, and that's something that I did acknowledge and sh definitely should when I make this argument is that you're, 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 you're absolutely correct. I do think that people with that time that they would gain from having like a universal basic income would allow people to have the privilege. It's honestly a privilege that we have to be so informed as we are, you know, it's a privilege and we should recognize it as a privilege as it is. Um, because a lot of people just simply, when you're working two jobs, you do not have the time to engage with politics at this level. You just simply cannot. And so I, I totally agree with you there. I could see, I could totally see a, 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 a highly beneficial uh, effect from that. That gets onto the concept that was introduced and we've talked about it a lot on the podcast just because I'm a huge fan of his writing and the, the late great uh, David Graeber who was really informative on uh, you know my whole understanding of the world view. He uh, published a lot of uh, great books, uh, The 5,000 Year History of Debt, but also he published this tr treatise on uh, on the phenomenon of bullshit jobs, mm -hmm. uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, it, which later expanded into a book called Bullshit Jobs. And one of the arguments that he presents in that is the fact that essentially what we've been doing is we've creating these been creating these sort of like horseshit managerial jobs to take care of and fill the time of the, uh, you know, managerial class, which are essentially uh, what the, you know, uh, ownership class views as worthy uh, employees, worthy individuals, people who they think, oh, well, we have to have these people taken care of it. Uh, otherwise, you know, the system falls apart, right? And, you know, he was talking about how uh, that was actually something that they recognized. And the reason that we don't have a 15 hour work week is because when guys like Keynes were looking at these productivities, it, it was on the back of all these massive labor wins uh, from the New Deal and before. And so they're just talking about how, okay, this is how it's going to continue with that trend. Uh, unfortunately, those things were all hollowed out during the Reagan years. And what you were left with was this massive divide between people who were working these sort of menial horseshit kind of jobs that were just to occupy their time so that you didn't have this kind of displaced class of people who, uh, you know, their management may not be n needed, but they're still on the payroll, like director of this, like, you know, anybody that's worked for a corporation knows how this goes. It's like, what the fuck does that guy do? Yeah. Nothing. He literally like, and I'll be the first to admit it, man. I've had cushy jobs where I don't do fucking anything. I literally had a job for eight months where I literally did not do anything. And, <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I will freely admit it. I, 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 you know, it, it's just one of those holes in capitalisms where you're on the payroll and nobody, you know, where you're working remotely and nobody says anything to you. You don't get a project assigned to you. You watch your direct deposit come in. You know, okay. and those are things that people are, you know, if you're in that situation, you know, that's not something to bitch about. That's something that's extremely fortunate because you're having your needs met and everything like that. But it does take your time away from. You know, if you're showing up to an office every day and twiddling your thumbs, like, you know, you're not act engaging in activism, right? You're still away. And he makes the point that this was done very intentionally um, as a way of like keeping society together and not losing it after the, the great threats of uh, pushback from the 60s and the, you know, the anti-war movement, the black power movement, um, you know, the civil rights movement, all those sorts of things. Uh, it was a retaliation to that. And that's why we kind of have this like proper uh, professional managerial class divide that we see now. Yeah. And I think the gig economy is another big major part of that, yeah. those bullshit jobs. And you see folks that, you know, you, this gig economy, you're not really a, an employee of these, these companies you, in the, in the, like, you're contractor. I believe, exactly. You're an independent contractor and that is correct me if I'm, that's what prop 22 was, right? Was it? Yeah. Was so it essentially prop 22 yeah. so, would have forced them to be not, uh, uh, I nine contractors or whatever the fuck it's called in your taxes, where you have to give like a quarter of your earnings back to the government at the end of the year. Instead, they would have been entitled to overtime, health insurance, all these things that a yep. regular worker is entitled to if you're an actual employee. Exactly. Minimum wage, things like a minimum yeah. wage, like they don't even have to be paid a minimum wage. You can sit there and I, I at one point I was driving for Uber um, and, you know, you might go out there and not get any, you know, calls for and you sit there for an hour, you get zero dollars for that hour. And no, that's, you know, they're they don't have they're not responsible for that in any way. Uh, and so I think that the, you know, the gig economy definitely puts that that, you know, that into perspective and, and is one of the things that are exacerbating that issue of the bullshit jobs. Um, and you have what you can see happens is you get as as long as we have these capitalists, you know, this capitalist class that we empower and enrich through our labor, as long as we're stuck enriching the capitalist class through our labor, then they will turn around and you can look out throughout history at what they've used that money for, you know, from the, 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 the surplus of our labor, they take that surplus of our labor and then they get together and they do things like buy politicians or, you know, fund these, 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 these mass, you know, misinformation or disinformation campaigns to, you know, to, to sway political, you know, public opinion on a policy like that. 
that and to have the the you know the government work in their favor in order to continue to you know oppress the, you know workers and to keep workers in these bullshit jobs because it benefits them to keep people in i've heard people someone describe it as not the proletariat but the precariat um now that we live in a we're the precariat because we're, we're you know it's a precarious proletariat we're, we're, we're in these really precarious jobs where it's like you know you can lose your job at any second we don't have any union protection anymore at our peak we were at 33 percent union uh you know um uh membership it's just whittled down to less than 10 percent of people less than one in every ten Americans. now yeah one in every nearly 20 americans now versus one in every three americans before that were part of unions and that's when we saw all the gains happen and you can actually see there's this cool graph this is not great graph. it's not cool but it's it's an interesting graph to watch and you can see the 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 um union membership versus uh you know versus uh uh wages and you know as union membership like increased we got like that's when we, our wages like maxed out when we were at our our our, our max wages and then it's just dipped since then and, and, and employees haven't been able to get any of the gains of their of their work because the capitalists will do everything in their power to destroy unions to dismantle to weaken unions and that's a lesson that we should learn on the left is that let's not repeat history you know those who you know don't know history are doomed to repeat it as they say and um and if we are not aware of this and we don't focus on this and recognize that that history there and, and historicize these issues we'll we'll lose sight of that and maybe fight you know spend all of our energy and effort fighting for things like a union when we know what the end result of unions are in a capitalist system is going to be they the capitalists who have all the money and therefore have all the power will fight like hell to dismantle those unions because they know the damage that a union can cause and so yeah i, I um uh yeah i i, I think that that's you know, we see that same pattern play out and we have to be wary of that and try to use that history um, to to try to learn from that history, really. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That's so accurate, uh, Kamali. Um, if anyone's just joined the stream, make sure to give us a subscribe and also check out uh, Kamali's Radical Democracy show in the, in the description. Um, and thanks for everyone for tuning in. Uh, before we let you go, Kamali, I did, I did want to uh, play a little bit of this, a uh, few clips from this interview that we were talking about, the, the Yang speaks uh with nina turner because there, there was a few good uh moments on there that i did want to get your reaction to uh i know we're both huge fans of all three of us are huge fans of nina turner over here and, and there was some pretty good parts of this conversation oh yeah um so yeah we can listen to a little bit of this um and then uh and, and then his mistreatment of the hands of the media and the dnc just like uh like um oh yeah it. sorry they're, they're talking about uh bernie sanders and his his mistreatment at like the hands of the media, the way that um, the the corporate media basically uh, blacked out Bernie during his his run, and and uh, you know Yang acknowledges that, and then him and uh, Turner go on to you know reflect on that fact a little bit. You know, like not that significant a thing in, in sixteen, um, and then uh, and, and then his mistreatment at the hands of the media and the DNC just like uh, like um, made me even more fired up. Uh, where you talk about it's like well the media didn't get it or whatnot it seemed pretty clear to me that the media was trying to uh, minimize the level of Bernie Sanders support where a lot of the coverage was like and he can't win and like did this person you, you know it's like well this is interesting it's like oh surprising how many people are for this guy and I was like have you actually heard the guy speak and it seemed very clear um, certainly after the fact even that the DNC kneecapped him and did him dirty uh, you know that I, I think. On the merits, um, if Bernie had been just allowed to compete freely against Hillary Clinton, I think there's a great chance he would have won that race. The media wasn't trying to put its thumb on the scale um, uh, against him if the DNC rules and the superdelegates weren't against him. I think there's a great chance he would have been the nominee in 16. And I think if he'd been the nominee, he would have beaten Trump. Well, you know I agree with that. Amen. Is what, amen to everything that you said. And it really stoked for the... Bernie Kratz, people who believed in the senator from the beginning, resentment with the DNC, and you saw that play out, and you still see remnants of that. I think the party has a long way to go to heal, and to heal, you have to admit when you are wrong, and I, that still has not happened, but I totally agree with you. We would be talking to President Bernard Sanders right now instead of uh, having to deal wow. with uh, instead of having to deal with the terror that we have. Yeah, so uh, I think that's definitely true, and, and it's cool to hear you know Andrew Yang acknowledge that too. That uh, if it weren't for the media and the Democrats uh, fucking around in 2016, and obviously this time too, we'd probably be uh, you know living under Bernie Sanders instead of the insanity of Donald Trump and everything we're going through now. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I mean, look what we had. And I mean, they left it up to this, these razor thin margins, you know, Joe Biden, you know, he was able to, to, to just barely by the skin of his teeth, uh, you know, win this election. And, and he lost, uh, interestingly enough, you know, his, his support, Trump's support actually increased among all groups except for white men, which was, um, you know, shocking to me was that, you know, it's the exact opposite of what you would believe if you watch nothing but, you know, corporate mainstream media, you would assume that, oh, no, you know, it's the exact opposite of that. And that Biden made gains with all that. And we were told that Biden was so much better with black people because one state, South Carolina, you know, where the, you know, they have a very old, a much older uh, population. And there's a, a massive generational gap, even amongst the black vote, there is a massive generational gap amongst the black vote, um, where young black voters are much more progressive, uh, much more left than older black voters. And so, but they they use that as the narrative of, oh, Bernie's bad with black people and he's great with, and, and Biden's great with black people. And that's where the black support is. So we got to stick with Don't you know you're not black if you didn't vote for Joe Biden? Oh, oh absolutely. You know, I clearly, clearly guys, you know, this is a mirage what you're seeing here, you know? Um, uh, so I literally like got the green nails just for like my green party support i had to oh, do hell yeah. very green yeah. nail just for that um yeah because i love my you know and and like um but yeah no that's that that was that was what we were told is that you know biden's so much better um but we know that like bernie really did you know he was bringing out one the latino vote was really significant and you know the, trump got like I saw one thing that's had him at 50% with Latino men, but I, we have to wait for, you know, the, the final numbers come out. It's based on exit polling. Yeah, exit Edison. polling. Exit polls can Polls be are really dead to me right now. Yes, yes. And that's a conversation that we should definitely, like, we got to acknowledge that. Like, I was paying attention to polls and listening to polls throughout so this. Are we? I'm done. I'm done with that. Like, yeah, next fuck time, it. I'm not Silver's playing dead that game. To me. He can go out behind the chemical sheds. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> polls were off by worse margins than they were in 2016. And it hasn't, they haven't reckoned with it yet. And they really need to. And that was even with them trying to adjust for that sort of silent Trump vote. And so, uh, yeah, I think that, um, you know, what we're seeing, though, is that Unfortunately, and what they sort of talked about there with Yang and Nina really is that, and you mentioned it earlier, actually, Gavin, is that I think that the Democratic Party is just learning all the wrong lessons, you know, from this. And while they, they, they will not acknowledge that, a, you know, Bernie would have won, um, you know, and, and honestly, the Biden probably won because of the work of, of Bernie Sanders. You know, Joe Biden didn't do a damn thing. And his like, base. Yes, exactly. Like, ex exactly. When I say Bernie Sanders, it's like Bernie Sanders and his base, of course, because I think Bernie was out there. I mean, Bernie was out there campaigning when Joe Biden was, you know, in that basement and stuck in that basement. And I really think that this the pandemic just played perfectly into Joe Biden's hands because that was their strategy anyway, was keep Joe Biden out of out of the light. And they just got to to parlay that into, oh, he's doing it because he's responsible and he doesn't want to spread COVID. But really, it was no, we're just trying to keep him out of your sight because and let try to let Donald Trump hang himself. Yeah, they got they got so lucky in the sense that they got to just you know chill in the basement and hang out. And, and I think another great point that Nina Turner makes in that in that little clip that I played that's just so true and that the Democrats uh, have not grappled with at all is that uh, like what they did to the Bernie. Uh, base what they did to the left in 2016 and 2020 is not something that has just been forgiven and forgotten like like people like me you know who at one, at one point were fine and had no real qualms voting for the democrats are now like permanently turned off for ever wanting anything to do with these fuckers ever again in my entire life let alone voting for them let alone giving them my money like that they, they need to address this rift that they have caused in their own party by the way they treated uh, one of the candidates that was running in their primary. Like, it's their fucking fault that we can't stand them, that we hate them, that we understand and see through their corrupt bullshit. And obviously, of course, also thanks to Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and what we learned about that. You know, so uh, I just think it's insane that they, they're just going to pretend like that never happened. You know, Hillary Clinton gets to nominate Tim Kaine and pretend that there wasn't a fucking political revolution that just happened. Uh, same with Joe Biden and Kamala. Like all they had to do was, you know, nominate or, you know, give Bernie the VP or something. And it would have, I mean, it would have been enough to, for people like me to want to vote for him. So uh, I just think it's crazy that like, I feel like it's been 68 after they installed Hubert Humphrey, instead yeah. of, you know, putting McGovern in and the next time around, we got somebody like um, Ed Muskie or somebody like fucking horseshit. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's like, they didn't, they didn't, they're, they're still like living in the, 
in this like old back room, smoke filled room where it's like the public isn't aware that they're being like fucked by these yeah. people. And it's so plain as day. And then they go on MSNBC and they go on CNN and they're, they just don't understand. Oh, why, why are these people not voting for us? I don't understand. It's because <laughs> you don't fucking stand for anything. Uh, you've been parroting a bunch of horseshit about how the uh, president is an arm of another country with no evidence for the past four years. There's been a pandemic. There's been no talk about how you're going to give people health care. There's been no talk about how you're going to keep people in their homes. Like, you know, I misread the polls, but I, I mean, it, it doesn't surprise me that anybody came to the decision that is like, fuck this. Like, why would I didn't even want to vote on Election Day? I, I did. I didn't want to. I didn't even want to show up. Who the fuck did I have to vote for? You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. It, it, you know, yep. it's like everybody has that feeling, I think. Yeah, no, I was uh, I, I knocked on doors for Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire. I drove up to New Hampshire from Massachusetts in 2016 and knocked on doors. And I'll be real. It was more against Trump than for Hillary Clinton. But it was enough that I still, you know, supported the Democratic Party, considered myself a member of the Democratic Party. I was, a, you know, I was a part of the Democratic Party. Since then, I've, I've, I've you know, dem exited since then. And for the first time ever in my life, I mean, I'm, I'm 33 years old. I voted. The first person I ever voted for was Barack Obama in 2008 um, in an election. And since then, I voted, you know, I've been a member of the Democratic Party and voted for the, the Democratic candidate. I've never voted in a primary election until this this year. Um, and 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 I, you know, but I was one of those, you know, like, you know, Dem, you know, supportive voters. And they from 2016 to 2020, they were able to to, to push me so far to the left um, and to just push me all the way out of the Democratic Party, because I feel like there's nothing there. There's nothing left for me there. Um, and that's why I do plan to try to, you know, put a good, you know, a good bit of my energy. I want to put some energy into trying to do what we can to bring about a movement for a people's party. And I saw your, you know, your, your, you know, I saw, I saw, I didn't get to watch the whole video. So I, but I did see that you had a video about, um, you know, a, unifying the people's party and like yeah. I, that is something you know my my super producer tammy um who was in the comments shout out to tammy there um and shout out to what up too i see you in the comments another one of our radical democracy crew um we've actually had what up america on our show that was our 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 comrade from the west coast that um you know is a is a uh climate activist and joined us to talk well, about shout out uh, homie thanks for tuning in yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you subscribe. What up? Um, definitely subscribe to the channel. Uh, and um, yeah, but we we um, uh, totally lost my train of thought there for a moment. Um, uh, uh, yeah, were we anyway? Oh. Uh, you think you uh, go ahead? Oh no, just just I think that we were talking about uh, leaving the, the yeah, Democratic yeah, Party, the merging behind. of the third parties. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And so I that was something that Tammy was the first person to say it, and as soon as she said it, it hit with me, and I was like. Yes, that is the move that must be made. We must push and advocate. And that's part of our job here. And, you know, I, you know, I hope that y'all will push too. And you already are by, you know, with that video, I, I plan to put out a piece, you know, similar because it's definitely how I feel that we must advocate for a unification of left third parties because we cannot play this game where, and I talked about at the beginning of the show, you know, part of what I want to do with the radical democracy is to try to bring about a unified left. And that is the first step that we can take is to unify under the, 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 you know, the tent of the people's party. I think that you have to use the people's party because as much as I love the greens and appreciate what they've done and the work that they've done and have nothing but, you know, the utmost respect for all the work that, that all of those activists put in and the work that they do has to be, you know, goes without saying, those are really hardworking people. And I appreciate the hell out of what they did. You know, I voted green this year. So definitely appreciate what they did there. But the People's Party has a momentum behind it, I think. It has, you know, advocates from, you know, the top to the bottom. You got pe people like Nina Turner and Cornell West out there. And the thing is, I think you can structure the People's Jimmy Party. Dore. Jimmy Dore. Yep, Jimmy Dore. <laughs> um, and you can structure the People's Party in a way that at least early on, it could function sort of like a working families party where, yeah. you know, th they essentially are, you're, you're voting for that party on that, you're voting for a person on that line and they sort of are, are nominating a person. So even sometimes with the working families party, like they'll, they'll nominate the same person uh, under the working families party, like working families party, I think nominated, um you know, like AOC say, you know, and so you, you can, you can choose to vote for the same candidate either under the democratic line on the ticket or the, the working families line. We can do the same thing to gain power because in order to get ballot access, that's how you can end up getting things like ballot access and things like that. And what we need is folks, groups like PSL, the green party, 
you know, DSA to yep. agree to unify behind the People's Party because it's 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 new, it's different. I think that the Green Party, one of the things, the problems with the sort of I don't like to use this word, but like the marketing behind the Green Party is that I think that it gets a sort of a a the image of it is that it's sort of like tree huggers, you yeah, know. Yeah. And, and, yeah, we've talked about that a lot. And and frankly, even the Green New Deal, I think you could argue the same thing. It, it should have been called the New New Deal because yeah. when people hear the Green New Deal, they just they think, well, this is like this far left takeover of our government that's going to make everyone a tree hugger and we're going to get rid of cars and get rid of cows and get rid of plants. Like, it, it, yeah. it, it lets Fox News. <laughs> we're all going to have to turn into Gavin is what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it allows Fox News though to kind of yeah to just associate it with like Greenpeace, you know, like these yeah. you know, people yeah. that tie themselves to trees to prevent them from being cut down and stuff. Like that's the that's the like link people make in their mind. So I, I totally agree with that, and and I, I think that the the third party unity, like if there's ever going to be a successful third party candidate, they're not only going to have to unify all those leftist third parties, but in my opinion, and I know this is a little bit controversial, but like. Like I genuinely think that about 75% of people that end up voting libertarian aren't actually, they don't actually believe in libertarianism. They just believe in like, I, I want legal weed and I want like, I don't want the government in my business. So they're, they're not actually like, they don't actually believe in the tenets of libertarian economics, which is something that's very far removed from, you know, progressivism or socialism. But I think a vast majority of the people that vote libertarian could easily be funneled into a movement for a people's party if they embrace the right messaging, if they, uh, you know, put an emphasis on freedom and, and the fact that like, yeah, I mean, we're in favor of government programs, but it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like big freedom government. From corporate oligarchy is the yeah. way that I think it should be yeah. marketed to them. Freedom from corporate and making the point that, yeah, just because, uh, you know, sometimes the government has to come in to prevent corporate tyranny, you know, there's government tyranny, yes, but there's also corporate tyranny, which we're, we're seeing, you know, at a, uh, the, the government totally allow. So uh, I think if it's marketed right, it could totally coalesce that vote. Like, I, the, trust me, there's a lot of people um, that I know that voted for Bernie, that supported Bernie, but then they turned around and voted for Joe Jorgensen. You know, obviously libertarianism is not what Bernie Sanders was repping at all. That's the furthest from, uh, you know, his socialist values. But uh, when it comes to voters, they don't necessarily vote based on some like really uh, you know, well thought out political philosophy that they have. They just kind of vote on who's offering them something that they want. And I think that that's what the libertarians have to whatever degree they have been successful. I think that's the uh, what their success has been. The fact that they're just making their party look cool with those promises. So I think that's another thing we can think about and even get some of those voters too. And I think that the libertarian party captures something that's uh something that's uh, an overwhelming feeling of just a feeling of just the ineptitude of our government and just this apathy toward and this feeling of the this like uh, like any any anything good coming from the government is just an impossibility. So the only thing that you can do is reduce the harm that the government is going to impose on you. And this is something that the Republican Party has leached onto, right? It's something that, you know, Thomas Frank got into with his uh, famous book, What's the Matter with Kansas, right? People are so convinced that the, that the government can't do anything positive to benefit them. So that's why the Republicans were able to, you know, gain all this support with on evangelical issues, uh, things like that. And it's why the libertarians are able to say, we're going to not allow any of this so that you don't have to pay any taxes. You know, it's this idea that any taxes is just money lost because you're not getting any tangible, visible return on it, right? Like in theory, you know, it's going to pave roads or, you know, pay for schools, but really, you know, how much of it is going to that? Not a lot. A lot of it's going to the war machine. A lot of it's going to bail out Wall Street, people who are already way richer, way better off than you. Yeah. It makes sense that all of these people are just like, fuck it. I don't want to contribute to that yeah. again. Agreed. And I think one of the effective messaging is to kind of, you know, talk about how, you know, obviously you don't want to have the tyranny of the government weighing down on you, which is something that many libertarians are concerned with. But you also don't want to have the tyranny of the corporation weighing down on you. So I think that there's a lot of room in that vein to start the conversation there and talking about tyranny from a corporation. And, you know, uh, if and under in a libertarian society, there would be no democratic voice to push back against anything uh, because uh, you obviously there's no workplace democracy as you and your show has sort of, you know, uh, built your namesake on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that uh, on the top, on the issue of workplace dem democracy as well, I think that that's something that you can you can pull over some libertarian voters with as well, because the if your issue is big government, the way that you can dis, you know, disempower the 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 government is by providing more and, yeah. and these large corporations and the you know the tyranny of the corporation. I think that the way that you get around that is by making sure that the people maintain you know maintain control and power over that, and it doesn't expand. We're not talking about 
the sort of, uh, you know, state capitalist or what they call like authoritarian socialism, uh, big C communism, uh, where you have these, the massive power given over to the state. I don't want to see, I don't care who the employer is, whether it's the state or a private entity. I think that the, the problem is the fact that they're an employer, not who, what their name happens to be. And so I think that that's a message that will also, that could also resonate. Um, and I hope that they will try to adopt some of that messaging because I think it's such an important issue. And it's the kind of thing where it's like, like you said, people want something that, that they can see and feel. They need something that, that feels like, Hey, you, if you tell people, listen, tomorrow you're going to walk into your workplace, you know, and you're going to be able to have democratic control over that thing. Like that's a powerful, that's something that people can, can, can see and feel and can actually, you know, again, and also like, you know, it teaches them how to participate in the democracy. Even I don't think that people really know how to participate in democracy, democracy, because we're so far removed from it. So I do agree with that. I also think that on the topic of like harm reduction that they like to use, and they always like to use the issue of like harm reduction. I've heard it framed a really good way by a leftist activist that I that I follow. Um, who said that, you know, it's not really what we're doing when we talk about like voting for the lesser of two evils and doing this harm reduction. It's not truly harm reduction. What we're doing is harm deferment with interest. You know, we're not really reducing the harm. We're just deferring it over onto a set of people that are going to get hit harder later. So we can, you know, we can reduce harm with a Joe Biden for the next four years. Sure. Maybe, you know, net, net pain for, for the masses of people will likely be reduced. You know, he'll handle COVID a little bit better, things like that it'll be reduced. But what's the reaction to a Joe Biden? Remember that, you know, Joe Biden was, you know, Obama Biden was the precursor to Donald Trump. So what do you think Biden Harris is going to be a precursor to, you know, something I fear far worse than Donald Trump could arise from that. And those next set of people that might be hurt in four years, it might be far more people than ever would have been hurt before. Um, so I do think that it's really, you know, this is an important time and like a critical moment for the left to start to push it. Not just, you know, not just the left, but I, you know, the, the masses of people, we don't have to call it just the left, because like you said, I think there's a coalition to build across the left, the, you know, some of the populist right even, um, and the, and the sort of libertarian folks, the folks that a lot of people self-identify incorrectly. If you ask them what they are, yeah, yeah they, they'll say libertarian, run down the issues with them and they, they, they're more of a leftist. And so uh, I think that we can run on the issues, not try, try to avoid labels at all costs, you know, avoid the socialist label, run on the FDR message, I think is the real winner. And like what up America is saying here, he said, you know, last time the left came together, the great Dep depression ended, it was communist, socialists and unions, and they threatened FDR to assert their will. That's absolutely accurate. And I think that, you know, if you run on the FDR messaging and say, listen, we're just going to be like the new FDR, we just want to do the new, new deal, you know, and I think that is better messaging. And that we can, we that's the sort of, you know, that's what, those are popular policies and we can win with that um, and, and, and build, build coalitions. But I think first coalition we need to build is amongst the left and making sure that we can consolidate and coalesce these left groups the same way that we just we saw on Bloody Monday in those primaries. The establishment was able to coalesce behind Joe Biden. We have to think strategically like that on the on the left. If we're serious about winning, if we want to win, we have to start to win in primaries. And the only way we're going to do that is if we have a unified left. I've done PSL events. I've been to DSA events. I've been to, you know, like I've been, you know, I've, 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 I've voted in the Green Party, you know, like I am one voter. I'm one person that is clearly aligned with all of these groups. So I know I'm not alone in that. And that if we can, you know, if we can, that's our first task, I think, on the left is to try to fight to coalesce those groups. And then the next step forward is to start to coalition build across, you know, the spectrum with people, things like money and politics, getting money out of politics is popular, not just on the left, but on the right, it's overwhelmingly popular as well. And so there, there are issues that we all believe in that are economic populist issues that we can run on without sacrificing any of our principles. We don't have to sacrifice our principles. We don't have to say, okay, it's okay if you hate gay people and you think that trans people aren't human beings. No, we're not gonna play those games. Uh, Michael Brooks has a great um, talk that he did at Lafayette University where he talks about program versus rhetoric. You know, We need to be focused on program over rhetoric. If somebody comes in and they're like, listen, I want to fight for Medicare for all, but you know, I, I'm not working with gay people. It's like, no, we're done. We're not, we're not debating with those that there's nothing to be, there's no conversation to be had about that. But if they're like, if they come in and they're like, listen, I want to help you fight for Medicare for all. And also I just watched this cool Bill Burr special that I thought was totally hilarious. And if your response to that is like, all right, nope, stop. 
We're going to need to unpack this for the next 12 hours. You know, we're going to halt this meeting and we can't go any further. You know, that kind of stuff. It's unwelcoming. It's uninviting. It, it's a losing strategy. And we cannot, we're not going to coalition build like that. So what we have to do is focus on the issues that matter without sacrificing any of our, of our principles and build coalition. And so that's, that's the fight, I think, for the next few years for us. I, I totally agree. And that's been a huge uh, mission here at the Vanguard is just trying to unite uh, people that I think have a lot in common that may not be on the totally on the same page. Like like Zach and I talked to uh, a, a libertarian, Aria Demetso, who ran for great sure. interview. I loved it. I watched the whole thing. That was awesome. Oh, thank you, yeah. yeah. And, and she's a and she's a libertarian. Right. But uh, I mean, I couldn't argue with her that. Uh, her, her main problem, of course, with you know taxes and all that stuff, is that it is going to fund the war machine. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a majority of your taxes do go to these companies to fund these immoral acts. And uh, so, I mean, I, I'm not going to make fun of uh, you know libertarians or people that feel that way because I, I can't even argue with that. That's something that's true. You know, uh, so I, I think you're totally right that we 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 need to um, you know really unify. And, and obviously, I'm not saying unify with all libertarians. There's a lot of libertarians that are fucking crazy. I'm not. Yeah. Not Anarcho like capitalists, essentially. Yeah, no, you know? my, Peter yeah. Schiff crowd. Yeah. But I, yeah. But I do think there, there, there needs to be a lot of work done as far as refining um, uh, the way we communicate with other, um, you know, people that may not be all, already on the same page as far as socialism and as far as uh, these concepts, as far as, you know, just coaxing them towards these beliefs uh, with, uh, you know, logic and, you know, rational thought that makes sense. And, 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 you know, we, we, we could totally work with someone like Aria who, who wants to, uh, you know, decrease the military, uh, defund the police, you know, like even Spike totally Cohen, who we had on our show, we were like, you know what, like I, I, you know, and we had plenty of things to disagree with Spike Cohen about obviously, yeah. uh, you know, but you know, even he was down with defunding the police. So I think, you know, while Gavin and Common I perfect- Bundy, the, the like right wing yeah. guy that was like, did the, um, his, his dad and him, yeah. the Bundy standoff and yeah. where they were like against the federal government, like he came out in support of black lives matter. And I covered it, um, on other, uh, podcasts i do uh racist media and we covered it on there um you know and it was like these people are principled there are principled people that can stand with us on certain issues even social issues like that where they will stand in you know in solidarity because it's you know it if you go to like you know the like um uh even like the liberal redneck i think his name is like talked about this thing where it's like if you go to some of these like like you know, redneck sort of areas and talk about like ATF to these people. They, they hate ATF. You know, they despise ATF. They come in there, they fuck with their guns. You know, they don't like people, you know, coming in and infringing on their gun rights and stuff like that. Like they want to defund those police, you know, like we need to align ourselves with them. If I can win that fight, I don't care. Noam Chomsky talks about this too. Like you can't be overly concerned with just because some bad person happens to agree with you on an issue. It doesn't mean that you should move your position off of that issue. You know, you should definitely reevaluate. Like, well, definitely. the left does the shit all the time, right? The left, and this is something that Gavin and I get so worked up about is that the left constantly eats itself over con- like little disagreements. You know, like we did a video the other day because Jimmy Dore and Anna Kasparian, you know, were just like coming after each other for no fucking reason. It's like ninety five percent of your guys' political views is identical. Would you like? I'm not even saying don't argue about the other five percent, but like let's start pretending that everybody on the left is a bad faith actor if they don't believe a hundred percent down the line with you. Like I was thinking about it. So I mean, Gavin and I we talked about it on this podcast. Like we don't agree on fuck everything shit half of our podcast's best moments are when we're talking about shit that we don't agree on you know what i mean yeah. and i think that it's getting into those nuanced arguments being a, you know and obviously gavin and i have been friends since fifth grade so we're not really worried about hurting each other's feelings when we disagree but i think having the freedom to just be like no i i, I totally think that you're talking shit on this or like you know or like oh yeah i kind of see what you mean and being able to be like you know i'm changing my mind because i disagree with you or you know we disagree on this but we're gonna have a different conversation about this and not just like you know uh, turning on, you know, cannibalizing each other whenever we disagree about something small. Absolutely. I think Joe Rogan is a great example of this because he's somebody that, listen, I I vehemently disagree with him. I mean, I vehemently disagree with him on his on his positions on, you know, trans issues and trans rights. I think that he's, you know, it, it, it can, it's essentially, you know, trans antagonistic, essentially. It's not just transphobic, some of his views. But I do not think that we should just disregard Joe Rogan and just cede all of that. Because let's be real, whether we like him or not, Joe Rogan's popular. He got 10 the, million the, subs, man. The most popular podcast on the internet. So to, to then just turn your back on him and see power to all of the, you know, Ben Shapiro's and, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Steven Dave Crowder, Steven <laughs> Crowder, like, like that's, you know, you're, you're, we're, we, we cannot do that. We can't.
can't, that's cannibalizing ourselves right there. And we have to get real about this stuff because if your goal is to win, I'm not talking about, you know, virtue signaling and getting to feel good at night. I don't care about that. I, I want the masses of people to feel good at night, not me and my okay, generally okay. You know, I'm, I'm generally safe. I have like a house, I, like I, I don't have my own house. I'm housing insecure. I live with a friend, but I, you know, it's a good friend and I'm comfortable where I am and I'm, and I'm safe in my, you know, I have it. I'm college educated. I'm generally like, generally speaking, like kind of okay, but I don't, I don't care about my own personal comfort. I'm talking about, you know, bettering the lives of the masses of people. And so in order to do so, I mean, look at where Joe Rogan has moved on some of the issue. I've recently seen Joe Rogan, like pushing back against Ben Shapiro on his nonsense. He completely like, he, he had Glenn ruined. on his show and I thought it was actually, you know, pretty, pretty good. And, and mainstream media won't invite Glenn Greenwald on, you know, like, like they don't bring on these people. Like, like, you know, it, it's so, you know, you, we have to be, we have to get real about this stuff and not, we yeah. cannot let our, let, let things like that stand in our way of, of, of gaining power. You know, if the left is really about, if we're serious about gaining power, then we have to be serious about, you know, all the outlets that we need to use and, and to, and to use to our advantage to do so, you know, Bernie Sanders went on Joe Rogan podcast and that was like one of his most watched podcasts of all time. Cornell West went on to his podcast and you can see Cornell West did amazing work with Joe Rogan. I mean, great. Cornell West has this strategy where he like disarms you with all of this kindness and he's like, and he's genuine and he like looks up all of Joe Rogan stuff and he's talking to him about how he likes certain standups that he did of, you know, and like he just totally disarms him. And then he's just sneaking in all this socialist policy in, into his mind and like, and, you know, and swaying him. I think that the left has moved him. He, Joe Rogan did his election day special. Moved him with, all the way to Texas so he could avoid paying his taxes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Joe Rogan did his special with Kyle Kalinske, yeah. you know, his election and day And Tim Dillon. But anyway. and yes, yes, yes. Yep. And, and by the way, uh, Joe Rogan, as I mentioned, he voted or he endorsed Bernie and then turned around and voted for Joe Jorgensen. So that proves what I'm saying about libertarian voters. They're not actual libertarians. They just want free weed and like they don't want the government to take their guns or whatever. But so, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And, and and I'm of the left. That's like we, we you know I'm, I'm uh, I think Jamie Peck from Majority Report was the one that said this originally. But like if you move far left far enough to the left, you get to keep your guns. Like I'm that left. You know like yeah, with same. me you get, you get to keep your guns with me. You know like that's that's uh, that's not the issue that I want to fight on. I yeah. don't think it's a winning okay. issue in America. You're not going to win on the issue of like you yeah. know that, like let's just back off of that. We don't need. Let's not even discuss that. Let's not make it in you know a topic because we're not going to win either way. But we can we can get a whole bunch of gains that make the the other material things better for people so that we don't have the same instances of like economic pain that leads to people into like suicide and you know mass shootings and things like that and we can actually alleviate some of that because the guns are already there and they're going to exist and if we just go adding gun laws to this country they'll just be disproportionately used against people of color anyways and yeah. harm you know communities of color ultimately so uh you know guns just like weed you know guns yeah. will be illegal for black people but totally legal for white people like weed was in this country for you know as long and as still I is in this country if you live exactly. in you know the the wrong area a absolutely absolutely 100 percent um well gavin i don't know did you have any other uh topics that you wanted to dive into kamali uh we want to give you the rest of your night back uh we really <laughs> really appreciate you coming in and chatting with us and like shooting the shit about uh the news for the week uh just to if for anybody who's just popping in uh last minute um this is a, a vanguard live stream with kamali over at uh, the radical democracy show yeah. um yeah, thanks so much for coming on and talking with us today, man. It was really awesome. Yeah, yeah we, really, thank you. we really appreciate yeah, no, it. You I appreciate on. you guys having me on. It's always a blast chatting with you guys. Really love what you're doing. And this it feels like just chatting with my buddies, you know, like and yeah. so it's awesome. I, I enjoy coming on. We definitely have to keep, you know, keep making this happen. Um, you know, I, I I'll definitely love to have you guys back on the show again soon. Oh. And, you know, so and I'd love to yeah. come back on again as well. And so, yeah, we just got to keep doing this. Keep on, you know walk the walk and talk the talk and actually try to start building a unified left by doing things like this. And so, yeah, yeah appreciate, appreciate you guys having me on. Appreciate, you know, you guys doing the work that you do. Keep it up. I've really, I feel like you're on a really good trajectory. I've been secretly a bit jealous myself. I'm like, well, these guys oh. are cruising along. Um, I wish I could keep pace with y'all. So um, just keep yeah, it up. Keep do something we do. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I I cheated. But you're talking about my my YouTube subs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I totally cheated. I just I, I at one point I had a hundred subscribers, 
on uh, a new on a new channel that I was building. But yeah. I had already built a channel like in 2017 after they legalized cannabis in Massachusetts. Okay. I created a weed growing channel and I made all videos about growing weed on the channel for the for a few years and they got really popular. And then all I did was people from my community were like, I was like, you know, I told them about the other channel and YouTube has this monetization goal that you got to get to like 1000 yeah. subscribers and guys don't even worry about monetizing on YouTube. To be honest, it's total trash. They take out like half of the money from you. It's totally absurd. They literally take 40% of your super chats. They take 50% of your super stickers. Like it's total BS. Um, oh, so God. just... <laughs> Oh, and you can't even get access to the money until you make a hundred dollars total. So you can't even withdraw any amount until you get to a hundred dollars. So we just got money sitting there that people donated that we cannot touch until we get to a hundred dollars. And you have so essentially you got to get two hundred dollars donated just so that you can get your first hundred dollars. That's um, good. Yeah, and they only let you take out in like hundred dollar increments or something. So like anything yeah. less than like the hundred, like you can't even touch. It's so ridiculous. It's just the most ridiculous monetization system. But we were after that. And, uh, and, and we, we needed, you know, we were like, oh, well, we can just get to the thousand subscribers if I just reclaim my old channel um, yeah. and move everything over. And I did. We, we, we moved over to the old channel, which had about it was literally like, like almost at a thousand subscribers. And so we moved over to the to the old channel. And after we moved to the old channel, obviously, before it was a weed grown channel, you got a lot of broad range of people from political, you know, oh, uh, uh, are you trying to like, like turn me into some kind of crazy leftist over here? Exactly. We <laughs> lost like 200 subs, like within a few weeks um, of making our socialist videos. So we lost about 200. We gained about, you know, almost three or four, you know, three or 400 back from it. Um, mm -hmm. But we lost a ton of subscribers. Anywho, but like, that's cheating. Trust me, what you see is not real. It's a mirage well, you guys actually have more real subscribers than me right now don't even worry you're, you're you're ahead of me you're doing great and you're cruising like those interviews you're killing it with these interviews and like keep up that good work i'm, I'm gonna try to start to do it more i have these nerves that i just i can't get over where i'm like i feel nervous reaching out to people i just feel like oh i'm not worthy of the, their time and i told well, hey man fuck that if anybody is willing to talk to us they'll sure should be willing to talk to you so <laughs> that is just a, a boost for your ego man we <laughs> You know, so but anyway, oh, I gotta uh, jump off here. I gotta take my dog outside. He's been fucking nice, nice. At the, little door right here for the, the last couple minutes. But uh, thanks so much for uh, taking the time today. We look forward to the next time we're able to jump on yeah. one of these with you, Molly. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to it, guys. Thanks, thanks so man. much. Dude. We really appreciate right. it. And if Thank anyone you, watching, uh, make sure to subscribe and give Kamali a subscribe too. Absolutely. Hit, Patreon. hit that Patreon. Yep. Yeah, One dollar a month. Patreon. Yep. Subscribe, because you please. Fucking 50% of everything. So hit up those Patreons, guys. Absolutely. Yeah, Appreciate it, guys. All Appreciate right. it.